We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Mantry and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Things went awry this week. We're recording late on a Tuesday night, which is unusual for us, but hey, we're going to get the podcast out. Lots of questions. Yeah. We're going to see how many questions we get through. Okay. Sneezing alert. Okay. If you are like a sympathetic sneezer, grab some Kleenex. Mm. I It is allergy season and I have got them. I've got them. Bad. Uh, my middle son was sick today or yes. last night. He woke up at 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock and came up and said, Daddy, I'm going to throw up. I'm like, well, don't tell me about it. <laughs> tell Just me do after... it and let me discover it later. <laughs> yeah. It, well, don't let me discover it on the floor. <laughs> what is the deal with this cable? I don't know. All right, whatever. I don't know what's going on over here. Did you contact Todd? Todd? No. Why would I contact Todd? I, I just got that email today. I'm a very busy man. <laughs> I wasn't on me. <laughs> Well, I don't know. You sent an email to me. I figured you might have sent it to the other guy, too. Was Who is it? Good? Forwarding everything to everybody. Oh, it's my, my job. Jeez, all right. Bothered. Well, there you I'm go. Sorry. I just I just got it today. I'm okay. sorry. I've been I've been busy, so <laughs> I am sorry. I'm also... <laughs> I hate saying this, because there's people who are actually cold in this universe. Mm. I know that they exist. But because of the way that things have been working in this house, my wife decided that she was going to go... Uh, to the St. Vincent de Paul Society, which on Wednesdays they feed the homeless. Okay. And so she was cooking a bunch of stuff until like almost 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. So the oven's been going since mm -hmm. about 6. So the house is a bajillion ah, degrees. Ah, right. And no one's going to turn on the AC because it's the winter. And it's actually cool in Florida for the first week in like forever. So, you know, I'm in here sweating. I'm literally sweating. I guess this is technically like the last day of winter, isn't it? That's... Technically, it yeah. is, but in Florida, we missed it. Yeah. We did not have winter this mm -hmm. year. We decided to just have sort of a mildish fall uh, in that that kind of hovered around, and then we went into spring a couple of times and came yep. back down. But Well, hey, now your seasons yeah. are going to be uh, flooded and not flooded, so, you know, that'll be good. Pretty soon, it's just going to be flooded. It's just, just, just going to be underwater. It's just going to be underwater. <laughs> Yeah. All right, this is AV Rant, the podcast that, uh, that answers your home theater and AV questions. Get your questions answered. All you do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You can find us at www.avrant.com, where you can leave comments, facebook.com slash avrantpodcast, youtube.com slash avrant, where you can see our videos and very soon not comment on them, because I think we should just disable them and just That's... beat YouTube to the punch. That is definitely a they possibility. Just send, them over to the, send them over to Facebook. Or just send them over to our website or something. Just put, you know, for comments, feel free to go to our website, which is... Well, totally... I'd, rather, I'd rather relegate those type of comments to YouTube, so that's fine. They can live there in infamy. Uh, YouTube. Yep. Uh, Contact Rob directly at rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at firstreflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. My Twitter is at avrant underscore Tom. All right, so uh, we want to thank our listeners of the week. Mm -hmm. If you become a listener of the week, you have to support the podcast in some way. Of course, we want to thank the people who have gone to www.avrant.com, clicked on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, where you can go to a PayPal donation site. So we want to thank Taylor, Joseph, and Daniel for doing that. Yeah, thank I think it's guys. Tyler, because there's no A in there. But I'm going to say Tyler. Joseph and Daniel, thank you very much for the donations. We appreciate it very it's... much. I wasn't expecting any this week, because we got, you know, no, much last week. was I. That, that was cool. He's... Like that? I didn't, say, I didn't check the dates when it have been like oh. the 12th or whatever it was. <laughs> uh, so Tyler, yes. Tyler, I'm sorry I messed up your name. It's 10.22 p.m. on a Tuesday. Yeah. And I went to CrossFit this evening and it was a hard one. Mm. So I am, I am pooped. I'm sitting down and getting up will require a bit of grunting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be honest with you. And this last weekend, I did a Savage Race. So Jeez. with my, my 13-year-old son turned 13 on Sunday. Mm. So... The, there's a savage race, which is like uh, seven miles or five to seven miles or something. I don't know what it is. And the the savage blitz, which is the shorter version, is a five k or about three miles, okay. three, a little bit more than three miles. So he, the savage blitz, which was on Sunday, the the youngest you can be and do a savage anything other than Savage Junior, which is ridiculous. It's like for toddlers. <laughs> is uh, I'm not even joking. Like their their warped wall was 
uh, no higher than three feet three feet tall. I mean, it was it was knee high. It was very funny. They had all these little kids and like you know, there's little soft little moccasin booty things. It was hilarious. <laughs> but uh, they the, like one of the obstacles was bubbles. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, hmm. that's that's Savage Race Junior. So yes. you know, thirteen when he was twelve, he was not interested in doing that. But he turned thirteen on Sunday, so St. Patrick's Day, and uh, he, that made him old enough. So him and his friend and I all did the Savage Race. Gotcha. So I I am still walking. Yeah, you made it here. I made it. I saw you walk into the I, room and sit down. So that much. Worked. I did not. Uh, I, I I did not fall on a single obstacle that you weren't supposed to fall on. I mean, I, I completed all the obstacles without needing any help of any cool. kind. So, very good. We also want to thank our 84 patrons at Patreon.com. Patreon is a service where you can become a sustaining member of your uh, content creator of choice or creators of choice. So, that means that every month, Patreon will take a, some money from you and give it to your content creators that you choose in the amounts of money that you designate. Minimum is a dollar. The maximum is infinity. Mm-hmm. We're still looking for that infinity, dude. Yep. Or gal. Let's be honest. That's right. We'll take either. We're, we're gender neutral when it comes to our donations. It's, so thank you to our 84 patrons. It's like a voluntary subscription. So if you'd like to sign up, it's patreon.com slash Podcast. And thanks very much to our 84 patrons over there. And Todd, I will be sending your email, uh, your e- your address along to the... To James. James. Yeah. That's right. It's gonna Who clarified that... You at one point said his house was a house of cards because he had a gazillion subwoofers in a room and you're like, yeah, it's all going to come crashing down. He's like, yeah, I downsized to two and it actually sounds more even than it did before. So okay. there you go. That makes more sense. <laughs> <laughs> that makes more sense. Getting there. Just little by little, the there. details will eke out. We'll get a house of cards guy. Um, we got to come up with a better name. All right. Uh, we also want to thank Fred. Uh, Fred talked us up to SVS. So if you can't support the podcast financially, which we totally understand, if you support us in some way, just let us know. Mm -hmm. Fred talked to SVS when he ordered some prime elevation speakers and sound path subwoofer isolation feet. He wanted to give SVS a special shout out since he didn't order the optional ceiling brackets for his prime elevation speakers when he made the original purchase. He just moved and now suddenly he's like oh maybe i should have gotten those brackets mm-hmm. so his address is different than his original order but svs made it all easy they just asked for his new address and they said they'll and they're uh i guess they're sending along the ceiling brackets at no extra charge thank yeah. you very much that's great yes. that's awesome we always love to hear that a uh, happy customers and good customer service so thank you fred for mm-hmm. talking us up to svs and congrats on those purchases yeah rbh so rbh i ordered those did i talk about this the bluetooth headphones and one of them stopped oh working. that was wasn't that like back at christmas or something like that yeah yeah okay. so i ordered those at Christmas, but my one of my sons doesn't really use his, so yeah. he goes to use them and they won't work. Mm. And my son, who does use them all the time and is familiar with them, he can't get them to work hmm. either. So I call uh, at, uh, RBH. They're like, "Yeah, no problem. We'll just you know we're going to send you some new ones, and then we'll get, we'll send you an email with some instructions on what to do with the old ones." Okay. So the old instructions were put them back in the box that we just sent you, yep. and then send them back to us at your charge. And I went, mm. "Yeah, I'm not I'm not, I'm not really going to do that." Yeah. So they're there, they're in the box. Yep. I've, I've I've followed the instructions all the way until the point where I was have to pay for something. I'm like, pay for return okay. shipping. I'm not. Shouldn't be that expensive. Shipping. They're not very heavy. They're not, but the box is not. It's like the size of a like nah. a a hardbound book i mean i'm sure yeah this is the postal service we're talking about it's not gonna be cheap <laughs> all right in the news uh jason and ted this comes from researchers at boston university demonstrated that 3d printing acoustic meta metal that can allow air meta material that's what i said <laughs> can allow i, I am going to be scanning this this is the yep. first time i've seen these rob finished mm. them yeah barely this not, morning barely we've this both morning. been very busy over the weekend yeah. so yeah so yeah i did a savage race what's your Frickin' excuse, Rob. Oh, I got many things going on, man. I'm moving relatives into care home facilities and stuff. Oh, that's right. Yep. Yes, 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 yes. And it was so, birthdays, yeah, celebrations on uh, yesterday, Monday, which is why I couldn't record yesterday. So yeah. it's all going on. Was it your birthday? No, no. It was a uh, nephew and my dad. No, whatever. Belated for both. All right. Acoustic meta metal material. I almost said meta metal yeah, again. You did. I like meta metal a lot better than meta material. <laughs> it's not metal, though. That would be better if it were. Yeah. I guess it could be. Anyways, that uh, this this meta material can allow air to flow through a ring shaped opening. <laughs> the jokes write themselves, but 94 percent of the sound is reflected back 
to its source. So text descriptions say it can work with white noise, which should mean it re reflects and effectively blocks sounds at all frequencies. But the video demonstration of it being placed on one side, uh, one end of a pipe while a fan blows from the other end and a speaker is playing from inside the pipe is only a single tone being blocked. So yeah. it's not more than one tone. So they played like a sine wave and uh, with the little ring not on the end of the pipe. So they have the fan is blowing and the air is going through no matter what. Yeah. You can have the air coming out of the end of the pipe, but you put this ring on the end of it, and then that tone, like, more or less completely disappears. You can hear a little bit of the whoosh of the air coming through, though. So it wasn't, it wasn't like, literally blocking all sound, but it was very effectively getting rid of the one sign tone they were playing out of the speaker inside the pipe. Very effectively. So, yeah. So th there's been some editorial comments about it blocking all sounds. They Those might be a bit exaggerated mm -hmm. uh, or speculative at best but the research themselves talk about being useful for hvac systems drone propellers and maybe even jet engines things that create steady noise and need uh, to allow air to flow through which makes a lot of sense and it also makes sense that it would be metal so that we could go <laughs> well back for a jet play. engine yeah i don't jet think engine has got to be metal play yeah, like gonna be plastic. plastic is gonna last on the end of a jet engine yeah but so yeah i mean some people were asking like ted was like he's like how does this all this work and I'm, I'm not entirely sure but it seems like a similar concept to like a helmholtz resonator right except that at much higher frequencies which is right. difficult to do because those are directional and uh, much shorter frequencies it's more difficult to have something resonate perfectly out of phase it to cancel that out the Way a Helmholtz resonator does for a bass, but I, I believe it's that type of concept because it looks as though it's taking the vibrations of whatever tones that it has been designed to reflect and it will sort of, you know, vibrate these little, it's almost like a helix shape. And that'll yeah. vibrate in sympathy with that and effectively cancel the noise from going in one direction while reflecting it back the way that it came. So, so in, the in theory, you know, whatever the sound of the jet engine, the jet engine generally is, you yeah. would hear the engine come up yeah, you know, they yeah. would make sound all the way up until it got to into that range, whatever that range yeah, was. Yeah, whatever could, the steady noise you could, is. You could kind of see that they might be able to take this, whatever this thing is, and have different parts of it resonate at different yeah. frequencies yeah. so that you could get like a range yeah. that it would work in. But uh, Yeah, so know. I mean, this could go maybe on vacuum cleaners or something like that. You know, it's there's yeah, a lot of things where this could make a lot of sense. If it's not tremendously expensive, well, why not? Quiet the world down a little. Yeah. Where, where do I put it on my kid's face? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, I don't think it's going to work for that. I don't think it's going to block we everything. Could, I could just keep shoving them into their mouths until they <laughs> shut up. All right, from Nathan. Uh, JVC and Panasonic announced a collaboration to optimize the way HDR looks on JVC's newest 4K projectors. It's only available when using Panasonic's flagship UB9000 Ultra HD Blu-ray player, which I didn't know existed, but here we are. Uh, but that player includes a couple of extra op uh, options for its HDR optimizer settings that are specifically meant for projectors. JVC's 4K projectors then have matching to uh, auto tone mapping presets options to work hand in hand with the known output levels from the Panasonic player. There's one pair of presets to maximize, maximize HDR brightness while sacrificing a bit of white color and a second pair of presets to maximize white color while sacrificing a bit of peak brightness. That's the one I would probably go for. Yeah. Both companies claim that a combination of these presets deliver better results than just the HDR optimizer alone or just JVC's auto tone mapping alone. This is a good experiment. I don't yeah. know that it's something that we're going to see widely implemented for everything but it's a good it's a good experiment I like yeah it. well i could mention uh we we talked about uh ben q's new ht 3550 that they announced right. that's the uh 1500 4k dlp that is uh one of the first to reach 95 percent of the dcip3 color gamut uh so they had a bit of an event over in europe and there was a step up model as well which will be the ht 5550 something like that i think it was a bunch of fives in there uh but uh yeah interesting there that they're taking a new approach to hdr tone mapping as well so it's all in development this getting hdr to look correct on projectors uh coming up with these different ways but good to see these two companies sort of working hand in hand being like hey we have a way to take uh what is on the disc and make sure that it always comes out with the same peak brightness no matter what the original disc said and then jvc says aha now if we know what's going to be coming out of the player then we can really optimize for that so yeah, good uh, partnership there. Yeah. So in breaking news, Google announced their Google Stradia. Stadia. Stradia. There's no R. Stadia. 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 Stradia. I like Stradia better. Stadia. 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 It's like Anyways, stadium, I saw, actually no UN. I actually saw this come across, like there's an announcement like on my phone, and I went to go to the news, and it was all Trump. Okay. I'm like, 
I just kept scrolling down. It was like Trump and, Even, and Marvel. Like they are dying to give me spoilers for Endgame and Captain yes. Marvel and everything. They are desperate to give me these spoilers, and I'm like, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not reading you. I'm not going to read this. I'm not going to read that. I'm not reading any of it. I say spoiler free for Ant Man and Wasp. It's been mostly spo- spoiler free for uh, Infinity War. I'm going to make it for Endgame as well and Captain Marvel. Yeah. All right, Google Stadia, their mm-hmm. streaming gaming service. They will leverage their many data centers to stream games that to basically any screen, as long as it's not connected to an Xbox or a, anything <laughs> that was a game system to begin with. Right, my Xbox 360, my I mean, Xbox One suddenly is like, well, yeah, I'm not going to do that. They will leverage their. Uh, I already said that. At launch, you will uh, want to play on your TV. Uh, if you want to play on your TV, only Chromecast devices will work. But Google Google made it clear that they want to expand to other platforms. They say 4K 60 with HDR and surround sound will be available right from launch. Sure it will. Yeah. They, made their, uh, they make their own controller and it's highly integrated with YouTube. Yeah. So. They even had a thing where they're like, if you're live streaming on YouTube through this thing, then other people can jump right into your game. I'm like, I don't Ooh, know if that that's sounds what awful. professional streamers <laughs> want. Is That's called stream sniping, sti- sniping, and we hate it. Yeah, I'm not sure if that was really requested by anybody. But uh, anyway, yeah, that's that's on its way. Uh, I mean, Microsoft already has their streaming game thing that they're revving up. PlayStation already has PlayStation Now. So, I mean, this is clear. Everybody's coming at this. We had, what, like on live and a few other systems before that have now kind of gone away or got absorbed by other companies. But right. they're clearly seeing, like, yeah, the idea is you are no longer have some super powerful piece of hardware in your own living room doing its own thing. It's just like some low-cost piece of hardware that connects your TV or maybe, heck, built right into your TV. There's plenty of TVs with Chromecast built in, so that might even work right there. And then as long as your internet connection is fast enough with low enough na- latency, and they're like, they can... Google is saying they can have lower latency because they've got data centers close to so many locations. So they're hoping that they can have lower latency than someone who's having to, you know, doesn't necessarily have all of those things set up uh, at locations close to residences, yeah. so... They're, they're well positioned to do this. They're like 4K 60 HDR at the start. They're like, we're going to have 8K 120 at some point. I'm like, you didn't really need to say that right now, but okay, you do you, Google. You go for it. No idea on what the price will be. Yeah. It sounds like they're, I mean, uh, they're obviously trying to break into the streaming gaming service right. that doesn't really exist, but uh, they are also clearly targeting Twitch if they're oh, integrating yeah. it with YouTube. YouTube and Very much. Honestly, after how badly they've ruined YouTube for content creators, uh, <laughs> I just hope they stay as far away from. Because I mean, and you guys might not. Some a lot of the people listening to this podcast might not care, but you know, there's people who made absolute living on YouTube for oh, yeah. a number of years, and then YouTube's just slowly, basically, took all their money away. Yes, they, have. <laughs> they just kept it for themselves, <laughs> yes. and now they've all. Many of those people have gone to Twitch, yep. and as somebody who has a freaking life. <laughs> And can't drop everything every time I get an email notification that a streamer that I may or may not be interested in watching has gone live. I'm like, I'm not going to. It's four o'clock in the afternoon. What do you expect me to do? You know, I just get out of class. You know, I've got light. I've got things to do. So uh, please, Google, don't ruin Twitch. (laughs) All right. Uh, Because that's how these people are now making their money. I wish they would unruin YouTube, please. But, you know, whatever. From comments here, Sean says he loves our show and wanted to confirm that it was the it was Lexicon. That's the right. That's right. That put their case around the Oppo Blu-ray player and charged thousands extra. That is the one that I found. You're there right. you go. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. I already forgot I'd said anything about that. <laughs> Tap has looked into Yamaha's music cast system a little further. He just wanted to mention that the $2,700 four-zone rack-mounted unit does provide some additional functionality that you cannot get from just using several individual music cast amps or preamps. Only uh, One key difference is that it can be tied into an intercom, doorbell, or surveillance system none of which I have. And when that type of audio signal is detected, your music is automatically paused and the intercom or whatever it is overrides it. And then your music automatically comes back after. So that's a thing that is, yep. could be important. I mean, for, somebody. you know, custom integrators who are putting this into large houses, that type of thing makes perfect sense. So, uh, absolutely. I totally agree. That's a, that's a feature. You know, if you're wondering, like you could get four individual amps, that have the same amount of right. power, and that would cost you $2,000. What is the extra $700 getting you? Well, more integration into those things. Like I said that before, that can be expanded to 32 zones, whereas the regular right. amps top out at nine. So, yeah, some extra things you're getting with that rack-mounted unit. Yeah. 
Adam has uh, heard us recommend the NVIDIA Shield quite often, particularly for anyone who wants to use Plex. This is about the only standalone box with the native Plex app that outputs full lossless audio. But we've also mentioned how uh, if the four, Apple 4 TV 4K could do lossless audio with Plex, it might be the box to get. Because mm. mm. it does all the other streaming that. services really well. It does. You know, Netflix does. and Hulu and all the rest of them. Right. Voodoo. The native Plex app on the Apple TV 4K won't do it, but there's an app called Infuse that will. Mm -hmm. You will need to get the paid subscription, uh, Infuse Pro version, but it outputs full Dolby True HD or DTS HD Master Audio bit streams. And best of all, Infuse already works directly with any Plex server, so it's only replacing the regular Plex app for playback on the Apple TV 4K. So there's another option. How much is that? How much does it cost? I didn't see the price there, and it's it's a subscription, so I think it's an ongoing thing. But actually, Ugh. what got me more interested in this than anything else is the idea of well, clearly the hardware is capable of outputting right. a lossless oh, yeah. audio bitstream, that it's not a hardware restriction, which means that at some point, hopefully Plex themselves will get their Plex app working that way, right? Yeah, I mean, that's a, yeah, they could probably, they, they may have already been trying to do it and Apple keeps rejecting it. It so. could be something like that. But if the hardware is capable of doing it, then, uh, then that's a good thing. What do we got here? Yeah. yeah, free trial. Great. That doesn't tell me what the price is. <laughs> Nine ninety nine for a year. That's not too bad. That doesn't seem so bad. Or ninety nine cents a month if you want to do it monthly. So there you go. That, Twelve dollars a year. I think that's quite acceptable. Cool. So yeah, thank you very much, Adam, because I did not know about that particular app. And uh, yeah, if you got an Apple TV four K and you don't want to invest in another box, but you want to get lossless audio using Plex, there's a great option. So that's good to know. Hey, great option. All right, let's get to the questions mm -hmm. here. Travis. Travis added some uh, DIY absorption to his room. Three inch foam on his front wall behind his TV and a one and a half inch th thick insulation on the back wall behind his seats. The room is open to the rest of the house. It's a 2.1 setup using Martin Logan Motion. Excuse me, Motion Series bookshelf speakers with SVS PB12 and SD and a Denon X2000. So he's got uh, one panel that's sort of horizontally placed behind his TV. Mm -hmm. And that's foam. So it's mostly... Yeah. It's foam. It's mostly behind the TV, not mostly behind the speakers. That's right. Mostly behind the TV, but that's where the wall is on either yeah, side of the yeah. TV is uh, like a window and then kind of a, a recessed Screen area back maybe. to his desk. And then behind his seat, he's actually sort of hidden these one and a half inch thick insulation things. He's got some that are like hexagonal shapes, so they kind of just look yeah, like I decoration. And then there's one which is actually a printed image on top yeah. of uh, insulation, which we love that. That's great because it just looks like a piece of artwork, but it's serving double duty. So the X2000 has multi-QXT, but it's old enough they cannot use the Odyssey Editor app. He knows any changes uh, from the new acoustic panels should probably show up mostly in waterfall graphs, but his Denon doesn't provide that. All he can look at are some simplified frequency response graphs of the EQ that Odyssey is applying. He'd like us to help interpret what the before and after EQ graphs indicate to him. Boy, I wish I'd looked at any of these questions before we started this podcast, because <laughs> it's just real hard to do on the fly. To him, it looks as though the overall shape of the EQ graphs has not changed much, but that after adding the panels is actually boosting, cutting a little more, a little bit more than before. Shouldn't it be less if the panels are helping? Please help them understand. So I'm looking at the before and looking at the after. Yes. And yes, it is cutting and boosting. It, I mean, in mostly the base area. There's right around some the, cutting. Yeah. There's some cutting, and I'm guessing that's right around where the crossover is. Just kind of yeah, now it's above the crossover. Right around it's 100 hertz, 110 hertz, mostly yeah. in that. And then in the after, uh, we're seeing yeah, very similar. I mean, so this this is what Denon is saying it's doing with its EQ. So this right. isn't the measured frequency response. This right. is the EQ that's being applied. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the ups and downs are basically all happening in the same spots. Uh, we're seeing in the after graph a little bit more boosting just above that crossover. Is that... The X2000 is able to take multiple measurements, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, up to eight yeah, measurements, X, eight different locations. Eight measurements. So, I mean, to averaging. me, to me, this tells me that... It, okay, so... His idea is that by adding the room treatments, you are your your EQ should have to do less. He's thinking it'll and, flatten the frequency response, right. the native frequency response. The reality the is that it doesn't. It shouldn't right. actually. What it should do is make the frequency spot response more even across all the seats, which means that your Denon can look at it and say every seat has the same problem, mm. and it, I can now boot. I can now cut or boost more based on what I'm what I'm measuring at each one of these seats 
Whereas before, it was like, well, this one has a little bit of it. This one doesn't have any of it. This has a lot of it. So I can only do so much yeah. because if I do too much, the one that doesn't have any of it is going to have a, n- a new problem. Yeah, I don't, I don't is... want to make the seats worse. So I have right. to not be as aggressive with the EQ right. that's being applied. So I think this is actually a good thing, what you're seeing here. I, right. I think that you're, what you're seeing is that your EQ is able to do more to get you to that flat response that you're looking for. Remember, room treatments, what we're trying to do is get evenness, not necessarily, you know, or, or uniformity. Uniformity, so yes. Each each seat has the same problems, which means your EQ can address it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is one of the issues with only looking at basically one part right. of the data. You know, it's, it's, and it is, I mean, this is great. We love this type of question because to try and interpret this stuff when you're essentially not being given the whole picture, right? You're seeing yeah, one absolutely. type of graph, yeah. which is not even really a frequency response graph. This is an equalization graph. This is saying, here's how I was equalizing before. And here's how I am now equalizing afterward. Right. Uh, then you're trying to extrapolate from that. Well, does that mean the frequency response changed in some way? And overall, like we're saying, the shape clearly has not. Um, so this is saying, I mean, the other thing is what is the likelihood that you put your microphone in exactly the same eight locations as the first time you measured? And that's probably pretty low. Cause I, I doubt that you, you know, put, you know, really clear laser markers that have never been moved or something like that. So you're probably taking some slightly different measurements, but we're seeing an overall similar shape, which is a good thing. And then, yeah, the EQ is now saying, hey, if I'm getting better uniformity across all these locations, I can actually be more aggressive with the EQ I'm applying. If you were to get Room EQ Wizard and a measurement microphone and look at the waterfall graphs, then that would be another piece of data. It wouldn't give you the whole story. still doesn't give you the whole story at all, but it's another piece of data to help you further understand what the added treatments have done. But I wouldn't expect treatments like these to really make much difference at all in the base. They're simply not thick enough to be having much of an effect at all in any of the base. Uh, But, you know, some of your higher frequencies in that, you might be reducing some of the echoes in that, which now, uh, remember, Odyssey also does work in the time domain. So if you're not getting that extra reverberation, it can say, hey, I can flatten out this initial frequency response that much better. Right. That's about it, I think. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah, I, w- I was just looking at the graphs again. Okay. All right, Mark. Mark is the fellow who found a deal on JVC on a JVC RS67 sorry, 67 projector on Craigslist for under a grant. He was happy to hear that we didn't think he made a mistake by buying it. What were we going to say at that point? But yes, we don't. Think he made a <laughs> no, that's a, it's a he, good darn good projector. Yes. He already had a Sony X800 Ultra HD Blu-ray player, same one I have. No. No, yes. you got the 700. I, 700, that's right. And he snapped up uh, one of the last Oppo 203 players since he already has a Sony X930E flat panel and wanted to try a Dolby Vision. So he should be good on the disc player front. Mm -hmm. If he decided he wants to try feeding 4K resolution to the RS67, which HD Fury device would he need? It's not a, I guess it's not a 4K so. Yeah, so the yeah, RS67, uh, it can accept a 4K resolution signal, but it cannot do HDR, and it does not have HDCP 2.2. So you need the one, whatever the one is that strips off the uh, HDCP. Stuff. Yep, that's all you need. So out of HD Fury's lineup, it would just be the Integral, which I believe okay. is down to $99 now. So Yay. that's not too bad from there. You could also pop over to Monoprice. They have an HDCP to HDCP one, uh, HDCP 2.2 to HDCP 1.4 converter as well, which I think is about 50 or 60 bucks. It's even less expensive. And that's really all you need because you would be setting your players to always convert HDR to SDR. So that would already have been taken care of on the player's end. Uh, right. All you're worried about is the HDCP to, uh, part of it. You're not worried about the resolution and you're not worried about the HDR. So it's just the copy protection. Uh, so yeah, HD Fury Integral if you're going HD Fury or check out the Monoprice uh, converter. Same guy? Yeah, yep, same, same guy. guy Mark. So he brought he bought all of his speakers before he started listening to us. He went uh, with B&W 600 series speakers, which are popular. Yeah, pricey. pricey. Uh, but after listening to us and snooping around the Craigslist, he got some Kef LS50 speakers and a pair of Focal Little Birds to try out as front heights. Wait, what? So, what? 
What are the LS fifties for? The front left and right. His front left and right. Yeah. He's, oh, he's replaced he replaced his front the... left and right with Kef LS fifties, and he got full cow little birds to pop up and up high as front, front heights. Yeah. Anyway, so he likes the Kefs way more than his BMW speakers. Mm. If he were starting over, he'd definitely go Kef or full cow. As it is, it will be a slow, gradual replacement process. In the meantime, he has extra BMW speakers on hand, so we expanded his setup to eleven speakers, but. He opted for front wides instead of surround back since the back of his theater area is wide open. What do you call that configuration? 7.2.4 or is it 5.2 point something? <laughs> uh, well, you know, it doesn't... Honestly, it would be, you're, it would be 7.2.4 if, if he has four overhead speakers. Yeah. But it's not really a configuration. It's really 5.2.4 with... With front wides. Front wides. Yeah. yeah. That's what I, I would call it. It's a 5.2.4 because you have that plus front wides. That's like Plus the additional wide, thing. Yeah. Rarely, rarely have any use. Yeah, because if you just told yeah. somebody I have 7.2.4, they're going to assume you have surround backs because right. that's what normal 7.2.4 would be. Uh, yeah, so you go 5.2.4 plus front wides. Uh, so yeah, that's that's cool. Uh, I'm happy that you're enjoying those Kef LS50 because I certainly would enjoy them. They're very nice speakers. Hey, there's somebody out there right now who's foaming at the mouth to tell us how wrong we how wrong this guy is about uh, BMW speakers. And to him, this person I say... First of all, we don't do that on this podcast. We don't tell you you're right or wrong. I mean, if about someone things. had gone the other direction, I'd also be going, "Great, you found something that you, you love." You liked, so yeah. yeah. So B and Ws uh, are well known and self proclaimed to have a sound. Yes, they do. And if you like their sound mm. in your room, then you will lo love B and W speakers. But not everybody has that right room or is in love with that particular sound or gives anything else a chance once they get the BW speakers. <laughs> so so, you know, going you know, taking this chance, going out and mm. listening to something else and, you know, running the risk of not liking the thing you already spent a bunch of money on or, you know, validating your, your initial choice. I mean, that's a pretty brave thing. So I really commend uh, our friend uh, Mark here for doing that. So yep. that's, that's great. And I would assume the next upgrade will probably be the center speaker because yeah, one, you one, want one those think. front three to match for sure. John. John has a, a small spare room, just over 13 feet long, a little under 11 feet wide. He was thinking he would like to use a projector in there, but it can't be a permanent installation. Is there a portable projection screen that we could recommend that he could move in and out of the room as desired? I have uh, and have worked with a number of different pull-up screens, mm -hmm. and I just love them. I think pull-up screens are the bomb, especially if you're in any sort of non-traditional uh, setup where you're like not sure if you're going to want to have it. Uh, and they end up being something that sits in your closet for most of its life. <laughs> but when you need it, you pull it out, you're like, oh my God, I cannot believe I have this thing. I have an 80-inch screen that I took uh -huh. to Australia. I lived with that for like the two and a half years that we were there. It's great. And I think it's... Uh, I think it's Elite. I think it might be Elite. Yeah, well, remember. Elite screens, they have theirs that they call EZ Cinema. It's the yeah. letters EZ Cinema. Uh, perfect for this. I mean, it just, so it rolls down into a tube that you can quite right. easily carry. It's got a handle. And then you just pull a stick up on the back and you pull the screen upward and yeah. hook it onto that stick. And there is your screen. They have multiple different EZ Cinema versions. They have some that are tensioned. They have some that are like a scissor lift type of thing. Um, yeah, I'd go with the cheapest possible one. Yeah, I mean, the one with the uh, stick is just fine because what yeah. you end, most of the time what you end up doing is the you know the stick collapses, like my stick collapses, just like mm -hmm. we're talking about here. It has a little you know hook at the top, but to almost fully extended, it still fits in the case. Right. So you can actually get it exactly where you want it to be, and then you know put the put the the projector up uh, put the screen up mm -hmm. and then when you don't want the screen to be there if you're like got a window on the other side you lower it back down you put the stick inside the case usually or even just behind the case would work and just leave it right there and people are like what's that thing on the floor you're like don't worry about it dude yeah. it's cool <laughs> but yeah for elites uh regular easy cinema one uh the hundred inch size in a 16 by 9 aspect ratio is under 300 dollars directly from uh, them and uh, even uh, less on amazon uh if you want the 84 inch size as a step down that's only 200 bucks so that's totally the size I would go. I for think I think uh, I think that'll probably do it. I mean, for this room size, I don't think you're probably going to be going much larger than 100 inches. I wouldn't guess that might even be too big. I so. get the speakers to any size. That's right. Size of <laughs> be honest with you, if you go 100 inches, I go 84 and sit closer. Yeah. All right, Brandon. Brandon's theater area is part of a larger room, but it's not open to his entire house. Full pressurization might not be possible. Oh, might, might be possible. Might be yeah. possible, although it would require much bigger subs, he suspects, and then would look normal in his home theater. 
says you. <laughs> he has some placement and size restrictions to consider as well. He started with a single SVS PB12 and SDs. If you could fit that in there, you could fit anything in there. Well, and not anything, he, literally, but yeah, that's pretty big. And he added an SB12 NSD when they were on sale. Using the Odyssey Editor app, he looked at the measurements and there what does appear to be a downward slope at the very low end. He's thinking that's due to the sealed sub not playing quite as loud all the way to, uh, way down low mm. or not playing as low, period. <laughs> I think probably as part Well, of it. it does extend actually technically even lower than the PB12 NSD does, but it is, yeah. it is rolling off, it's beginning its roll off at a higher frequency. Right. Yeah. Neither sub is maxed out on this volume dial, so we'd like to know if uh, a subwoofer upgrade would actually be noticeable and beneficial. If he's going to keep the same placement and size uh, con and concerns in mind, an HSU VTF2 Mark V could fit for the SB. Yeah, to replacing the SB. To replace the SB. Yeah. Do we think it'd be worth it, or should he get rid of both his SVS subs, ignore the size and placement restrictions, and just focus on getting a pair of larger, higher output subs that can truly pressurize his entire space? I mean, what he hasn't said here to us... <laughs> Is how he likes the base in his room currently. Yeah. I mean, he's looking yeah. at a graph and going, I'm seeing it roll off. Well, I must right. hate that then. <laughs> right. I, I, I have a hard time answering this question and saying, you know, I mean, are the, I mean, your subs are not turned all the way up to begin with. Right. So, you know, do we care that much? <laughs> and I mean, I, I'm assuming he calibrated them in terms of output. And, One would think. And, and that didn't require having them maxed out on their volume dials. Um, this was, this, I, mean, I mean, I I guess he just wants to see a flat line going below 20 hertz. I guess, I, think, I guess that's what he has in mind, which... Granted, yeah. the only way you're going to achieve that is by replacing at least one of these subwoofers. That That is going to be the case if... If what you see on the graph matters more than what you actually hear when you're watching something, um, uh, I'm I'm not gung ho about this because I don't think you really need to do this. But at the same time, you know, curiosity is perhaps getting the better of him, or just wanting to see that super flat looking graph. I think he's worried that the SB and the, and the PB are not playing nice together. Sure. That, you know, sure. And, and I mean, there is some validity to that. Yeah. And we would have said up front, if you would ask us to, if you should pair those two subs, we'd be like, yeah, I mean, you can. I mean, in a smaller but... room, I'd have no qualms about it. That's but... right. But this is not a smaller room. It's, not, so... it's a large room, but it's not completely. I'm going to put it to you so. this way, dude. I'm going to tell you right now. I think if you take a, if you just say in a perfect world where you could get the exact, your, your, your own PB sub and clone it. Right. If you could actually take the exact same sub right. and put it where your SB1 is right. right now. I think afterwards you'd be like, um, it's on on better, occasion, I on occasion think. and in the measurement, it might might look a little it's, I don't think that you I don't think that you'll be able <laughs> if there's not like some sort of weird like like huge suck out or right. huge problem at a very, very low frequency. I, I even then, I, I would I would have a hard time believing that you would notice it on. Yeah, I, this will uh, the not regular, be a night and day would. difference. This will not no. be anything close to that. This will be ten thirty p.m. versus eleven p.m. You know. <laughs> hey, right now ten thirty p.m. versus eleven p.m. is making a big difference I know. in this whole hot mess I, I got going on. Uh, okay, so I have a real okay. As much as I like. The shoe VTF2 Mark V. Please do not take my comment I'm about to say in any way other than saying I really like that sub, but I have a really tough time saying you should spend the $550 or so on that to replace your SB12 NSD and pair it with your PB12 NSD. That to me is such a small upgrade. I'm not going to say it's not an upgrade, but I'm going to say it's such a small upgrade that I have a really tough time doing that, justifying that. In my mind, if you're going to do this and you're just like, I want to see that graph be flat way down low, then it's upgrade everything time in my mind, you know, which means way more money. But it's just like, are you going to spend $550 to barely do anything or are you just going to go whole hog and get what you actually want? That's sort of where I fall on this. <laughs> I, I I think I mean, I think you're right. But at the same time, I still think in the end he's going to go. 
most of the time I can't tell yeah, the difference. Yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> you know. I mean, if you're going to do this, what, get a couple of PC 4000s, you know? Well, that's fit. what I'm saying. You're going to go, have subs that are absolutely going to be able to destroy this room. Yeah. And your volume dials will be even lower than before. Yes, they will. And, and yes. <laughs> but they'll and, extend you know, really linearly all the way down. Oh, they which, will. I You'll be able to look at that wants. graph and say, look at it, it goes down that's to right. 16 hertz. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah, Brandon. Uh, that's that's where I. F I mean, it's one man's opinion, but that's that's what he's asking for. I have a really tough time. To believe me, I like that sub. Nobody come at me and say, "Oh, you don't like shoe." No, no, no. Nothing like that. I'm just saying, in this case, uh, that's not the way I would spend my five hundred fifty dollars. I'd save it until I can get. This even is one bigger. of those times. It's like at when somebody buys new speakers and I tell them to to get off the internet yeah, for six months. Yeah. This is exactly that. <laughs> This is exactly that. Like, stop looking at the graphs, dude. Just enjoy it. Just enjoy it. And be fine. You have bass that is you know? so much better and deeper and louder than almost anyone else you probably know in your entire life. Not only life. that, you've yeah. probably been to movie theaters that don't oh, rock as hard as your, as your home theater this, does. Yeah. yeah, I've been in plenty of movie theaters where I'm like, I cannot believe I just paid. Yeah. We talked about going to Captain Marvel this last. My wife's like, let's do something fun as a family. Like last last weekend, I think it was. And I was like, well, we can go see Captain Marvel if you wanted. I'm like, <laughs> she's like, well, how much are the tickets? I'm like, well, if we're going to go to the movies, I ain't going to just the old theater. We got to go to IMAX. And I yep. looked up tickets. It was going to be like 90 bucks. Yeah. For the, for the five it's of us like to go. It's like 20 bucks I'm, a piece, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, it's ridiculous, dude. It's ridiculous. And my wife's like, no, we're not going. Yeah. I'm like, I know. And that's why we have a home theater. So we don't <laughs> yes. have to do that. I'll just avoid all the spoilers. So he previously asked, this is still Brandon. Bruce Brandon. He previously asked about replacing his current in-wall golden ear surround speakers with different in-wall speakers that might better match his, uh, with his Ascend Sierra RAW speakers that he's using up front for now. We suggested RBH Visage M414s since physically they would fit nicely into the existing openings and sound-wise... Uh, we said it would be much more neutral compared to the Golden Ear in wall, so it ought to match better with the Ascend speakers up front. If I remember correctly, this question was like, I want something different that will fit into the same box. That's right. So I, I have a so, cutout in my wall, so I want it the same size or a tiny bit larger because willing to make the opening a bit bigger than the existing one, but it's pretty hard to right. fill in. So I just want to make that clear because yeah. I don't want the, I don't want people to listen to the, this question and say, oh, we only suggested these because of this. I'm like, we were given the parameters and that's how we got it. But it's also part. still a choice I would stand by because RBH is... Is very oh, neutral and ascent yeah. is very neutral and it all just lined up in a way where i'm like yeah that'll work yeah. so he asked what about rbh signature reference in walls they use a folded ribbon tweeter and the sound of the golden ear folded ribbon tweeter is the main reason he had chose he had those at first so would the uh, rbh folded rivers ribbons be even better matched to his ascendant raw ribbon speakers would they be worth it are these as surrounds oh as surrounds as surrounds uh and those are not I'm gonna inexpensive say, speakers, man. I'm going to say <laughs> no. I'm going to say that this is this is an expenditure of money that you can feel good about not doing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, to me, I don't think you're going to notice it. It is not going to be a perfect timbre match to those Ascends. No. Um, no, and yeah, no, I, I just, I, I as much For as I surrounds, like surrounds, <laughs> I mean, I love them. Yeah. I mean, those, those are some Again, fantastic speakers. That. There's no doubt about that, but. Can we really? I mean, these are surround speakers. They are in walls or in ceilings or something. It's going to have to go in there. wall. In wall. I mean, yeah. th so the thing is, if you were going to spend this kind of money, the reason to do it would be to get a perfect timbre match, not just a right. maybe a hair better, but more different than better. You know, yeah. so I mean, I would take that if this is what you want to do. I would take that money and talk directly to Dave and be like, "Is there any way you can build me an in-wall cabinet with Raul ribbons?" Because Dave is the type of guy who might just be able to do that sort of thing for you. Or I would take the money you, the difference in price you would have spent on these signature references versus the Visage M series, and uh, put it on those subs you wanted. <laughs> That's, well, that's getting you a lot this is closer. an example of, of looking at the, the, the form factor of the speaker and thinking, mm -hmm. okay, well, this form factor looks more like this form factor, but therefore they match. The reality is, is the Rowls have a, or the Sierra 2s are what they are. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to find something that will match them as best as possible. Yeah, closest having to some, match. yeah, having something that actually, you know, ha is, is 
as good as the signatures are actually makes it harder to, for them to match with mm. something like something like the Sierra twos. Whereas, you know, something with a, a tweeter doesn't extend quite as high, you know, maybe that has a little bit of a roll off is a little bit more forgiving, a little softer, uh, whatever I think actually works a little bit better in this case because you're trying not to know. Yeah. As long speakers. as it's neutral, you're going to just be like, yeah. yeah, that all blends quite that nicely. All blends. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, all of, all of a sudden it goes from the 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 CR2s and then back to your surrounds and then suddenly this you know pinpoint accurate you know what? you know you know folded ribbon tweeter that or whatever yeah. tweeter that's in those those they are RDHs a little beamy, like, those folded ribbons too they yeah. beam a little bit more so, so than the I, rowls. I yeah, yeah. Uh, tough for me to say that one. I, you know, his next question is going to be like, uh, should I ditch the Ascend Sierra Rouse and upgrade everything to see <laughs> RBH signature reference? So that, it's, that would it's be fine too. That, that would be all right because we like those signature references very, very much. No one's, no one's going to tell you on this podcast that you shouldn't do that. I'd be but, I mean, at this point, you have speakers you like. If it's really that important you to get perfect timbre mm. matching, then do the thing Rob yeah. suggested. Or, I mean, you just, know, get, I, just get Lunas and put them on the wall instead of in the wall. Right. I am work. much... He's not going to want to do that because he know. wants to have... He wants to fill that box, that hole. I... Uh, fill that hole. I can't believe I said that. He... Uh, you know, Rob is much more along the lines of, of Brandon here, where, sure. you know, he's he's extremely concerned about perfect everything. Yeah. Whereas I tend to, to err on the side of once I'm in the experience of the movie or whatever, I can't I tend, I tend not to care so much mm. about, you know, the specifics, you know, what's going on around me and stuff like that. If something's wrong. Oh, yeah, I'm stopping the movie and fixing it. Right. There's no doubt about that. But it doesn't always bother i mean it, it doesn't always bother me enough the only thing that really gets me is of course amazon prime sucking so bad yeah. but i was <laughs> just trying to watch <laughs> i was just trying to watch the uh the expanse again with my son and my son was sitting there next to me and he was like the lip syncs off yeah uh-huh. like, don't even get me started <laughs> that's what you get <laughs> from- th- at, at the time 12 year old son looks up at me and says the lip syncs off daddy i'm like Tell somebody over at Amazon because if I, if you can notice it, everyone should. This notice is what it. you get for watching real movies and content instead of just sweeps and test tones and pink noise like me. See, I know that's how you notice yeah. those those timbre differences. <laughs> so he's able to get his uh, Harmony remote to command his uh, Marantz SR7011 receiver to use either HDMI out one or two, as opposed to having both HDMI outputs active at the same time. So that's been working perfectly uh, with both his Epson 4000 projector and the Sony X900F flat panel connected. But recently, his Xbox One started cutting out when using the Epson. And when he tried other sources in case it was just his xbox they cut out randomly too he switched the hdmi connection that uh runs to his projector uh to hdmi out one on his branch and that seems to work but hdmi out, hdmi out two on his branch is having these cutting out issues it's a 45 foot fiber optic hdmi cable that runs to his projector it was working fine before and it still works when it's plugged into hdmi out one so is something just going bad on the hdmi out two port of his Marantz. He preferred to keep the flat panel plugged into the out one because that's the arc port and he uses, uh, which he uses for the flat panel, but doesn't need for the projector. So what to do? Yeah, this stinks. It does. <laughs> Cause it does sound, it does like... sound like the HMI boards going bad. I hate to say or, it. I mean, or just the port is coming a little bit loose. Cause that's all it takes. Yeah. You know, sometimes yeah. I hate that HDMI is just a friction fit. Cause that is horrible. And when you're thinking this is a, 45 foot long cable. Is it possible it was just dangling, you know, pulling down a little bit? Just gravity, I'm talking about here. Right, on right. That friction fit. It just loosened that port a hair. And, you know, like you're saying, it's working, but it'll cut out a little bit. I mean, that to me sounds a lot like what happens when a port just gets a little bit loose. And every once in a while with the heat, because there is heat, you know. You can, uh, there are cables that actually, they, they have like a special adapter thingy that makes them like snap not snap well, they, in, yeah a lot like of hdmi ports in. and i believe the marantz have this they have the little screw just above right. and you can it's like a plug that's got just a little hook that just hooks into that little screw to keep a more secure connection i mean some people also just go in there with a pair of needle nose pliers and just pinch the end of the port a little that bit was going to gonna be it. my next suggestion yeah. i've done that before on phones i've mm-hmm. done that before on a number of devices to get them to because this to really sounds better. like that's all it is to be honest well it's it's only you better hope it is because yeah. the other option is that the hdmi that hdmi port's going back in which case yep you're i mean you call moran you get them to service it yeah cost some money but they'll do it so 
Dan. Dan has set up many systems using REL subwoofers and based on that experience, plus what he has been told by REL dealers and the instructions provided, he says that the speaker level inputs were never intended to be used as the sole input. Okay. Uh, instead, the idea was to use a subwoofer output of your AV receiver or pre-pro for the dedicated LFE channel, plus the bass from any speaker set to small, but to always have your front left and right speaker set to large and send those two channels via speaker, speaker wire to the REL subs. That way, you could always manually blend the subwoofer with the natural bass response of the front left and right speakers while still having a dedicated LFE channel as a separate signal, along with any bass management. So the idea was to use both type of connections at the same time for surround sound. And then for, for two-channel music, you would only be using the speaker wire inputs and running your front left and right channels as full range. Mm -hmm. If we stop to put some thought into it, doesn't that make sense? Nope. Gonna say nope, but, and we'll explain why. Gonna say, gonna say nope. <laughs> no, it does not. <laughs> but we will go on with your question. He says it has always worked very well for him, and he thinks the new REL subwoofer models that don't have any speaker wire inputs. We just lost this. This guy stopped listening already. I'm sorry. <laughs> Please keep listening. That don't have any speaker wire inputs was just a money saving move in an attempt to appeal to home theater crowd as opposed to the two channel crowd that REL has always appealed to before. So, any thoughts? Yeah, that what you, this is an, a school of thought that is uh, um, basically it's 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 at this point antiquated to the point of being laughable, and I I, <laughs> I, 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 I don't mean that as any sort of insult to you, sir. I want to I just want to just put that out there. This is a a train of thought that y if you have you should have full range speakers up front, right? Yeah. And then yeah, that's they, that's the starting point of this line of thought is that the right. ideal would be to have speakers that can play from twenty hertz to twenty kilohertz all on their own. That that's the that's ideal. Right. That most speakers can't do that, right. and therefore we're going to augment the bass with a subwoofer, but we're going to still attempt to get as close as we can to what we think is the ideal of truly full range speakers. That's sort of the starting point of the thinking, which is where we fundamentally disagree. And well, uh, 10 years ago, you know, you were as right as anybody else mm -hmm. was. You know, 10 years ago, no one knew where to put the subs in your house. <laughs> Let's just be absolutely yeah. honest about it. It was all we trial and error, wasn't it? It really we was. We really didn't know. Yeah. You know, we really didn't know. You, and, and on this podcast, I would say, man, you're just going to be able to put them wherever you can put them, put them in the spots you can put them and test it and see how it and sounds. And we were doing a lot of the, you know, one third of the way along a wall, that rule of thirds type of thing yeah. was very popular yeah. as advice, yeah. but it really didn't work in a lot of rooms. And well, now Harmon has explained mean, why. They did all the, the, they did all the modeling research and, and the actual measurements and they figured out why and where the sub should go well i mean and and the whole line of thinking of having the the the, the tower speakers right there and your subs right next mm -hmm, to them mm -hmm. that's still very popular you see that in a lot very of very much so see, unfortunately sbs tweets out pictures like that all the time <laughs> drove me absolutely appearing audio does it like gangbusters drives yeah. me nuts they just sent out like I just read something on an article that they tweeted to, or they put on the Facebook and I clicked on it. It was like the seven myths of home theater. None of it was about subwoofer placement. Right. I'm like, how do you, do you not mention that subwoofers are placed wrong? So anyways, but the thought here is that you should have full. Let's just be clear here. 99% of the people that have any sort of speakers do not have full range speakers. Even right. the ones that think that they do, do not. Right. You know, their their speakers do not legitimately play the full range of human hearing. Mm -hmm. They do not go down to 20 hertz. They do not. Many of them still don't even go up to 20 kilohertz. Sure, that, yeah. they, they roll off before then. <laughs> so you don't have full range speakers. Therefore, this 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 thought that you should allow your 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 speakers everything they are capable of doing is 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 not right. But because it doesn't exist. But on top of that, we now know that how bass works and how bass works in a room. If your speakers were full range and you were in a room the size of an auditorium. Sure. Or an anechoic chamber. Or, or an anechoic outside chamber. with no walls. Then having them play full range. Mm -hmm. to, you know, and pour, Or having you know, them standing uh, on top of subwoofers. You know, that or whatever. <laughs> right. Or whatever. They are co -located. Would be a perfectly fine way mm -hmm. to get your bass. Mm -hmm. That'd be just fine. But we don't live in those sorts of environments. So we live in rooms where bass bounces around like crazy. It, it goes across your room two, 
three times before it, it it actually finishes one full wave pattern. That's right. It's just it, it it interacts with itself, it interacts with the room, it interacts with everything around it long before uh it you really can even start to really register what it's what it's doing. Therefore we have to place our base or you know position our base drivers in a place that uh does the best in the room. And that is not where your tweeter is. Yeah. It's I just mean, not. The, the, the thinking, uh, the older thinking and the thinking that is still being described here is more of almost like a top down. It's like saying, okay, I, I'm going to start at the top of the frequency range and work my way down. And I'm going to have my speakers play as low as they possibly can. And then I'm going to bring the subwoofer in to just bring in that last octave or octave and a half or maybe two octaves, you know, if the speakers right. don't play very low. That's that's what the mentality, and I get that. There's, there's logic to that. However- It is. We have now turned that around and saying, no, what we want to do is get the bass correct first. We would actually like to play the play that bass out of well-positioned subwoofers to give uniform response throughout the room. We would like that to play as high as it can before right. it starts to become directional and no longer uniform, which will happen at some point because you know we're able to hear directionality once you get somewhere above 80 hertz. Often it's actually quite a bit higher than that before we can genuinely detect it, but somewhere in that range. So there's this area between about 80 hertz and about 200 or 250 hertz, which is tricky. It's tricky because we can hear some directionality in that range, but we're still below the room's transition frequency where the room is dominating what we hear below 200 or 250 hertz or so. So that region can be a little bit tricky. And this is one reason why in practical terms, manually trying to blend your speakers and subwoofers can, it can turn out well. We're not saying that that approach can never ever work, but we're saying no. that if your mentality is I want my speakers to play as low as they possibly can. You're setting yourself up for a difficult time getting good uniformity. So we like to say, let's get the bass as good as it can be, get it playing as high as it can while remaining uniform. And that's where we're going to set our crossover and we're going to have our speakers come in then, which means we want bass management. We don't want to be doing that without bass management inside of an AV receiver. And we don't want to be setting our front left, right speakers to full range ever because we don't want, we, w we would prefer that they don't have to even play down to 80 hertz if we could do that without getting directionality issues. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it's, you know, his 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 assertion that he's always had good results with this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I'm not saying that that hasn't been the case. You know, you very well may have very good results with this, but I imagine that objectively, measure if you had measured the way that you're doing it, depending on the speakers too. If the speakers well, are cutting and, off and at eighty hertz, anyways, how many seats yeah. you cared about too? That's a huge That's true. thing. A huge yeah. thing is how many seats you. If you've yeah. only ever set up systems where you cared about one seat, where it is primarily a one-person, two-channel music system, and sometimes it does surround sound. I mean, if that was the scenario, then that could right. absolutely be the case. You can have the one sub for one seat. You can have speakers playing lower potentially if they happen to be positioned in the room that works well for that one seat. What we're saying is it's yeah, highly unlikely to work. For multiple seats. He's saying that that it's it's he's always gotten good results, mm -hmm. and I, I think objectively, if you had done it the way that we're saying, which is cross over everything at eighty hertz, yep. send all of it to the sub, yeah, the position the sub correctly. Yeah. yeah, if you had if you had done it that way, I think objectively you would have better measurements, and subjectively, you probably because you have never it doesn't sound like you've ever done it. Subjectively, you may agree with those measurements. I just I mean I, it the the science is there. Right, and yeah. I, it, it backs us up and, you know, as much as people want to argue these things as some sort of, well, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years and it's it's always worked for me. Well, you know, good on you, I suppose. I don't know what you, <laughs> tell you. I don't know what you want me to tell you. You know, I had a guy on Facebook just the other day. who was like, my daddy always taught me to ride against traffic when I'm riding my bike. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the way it should be done. That's the way I'm going to do it. I'm like. Your daddy was an idiot, and you're an idiot for not knowing any better about it. But okay, guy, you know, my, my takeaway is you don't actually ride a bike. Because if you did, eventually you would have gotten hit by a car. <laughs> you know, it's just a matter of time. You know, so that sort of argument doesn't really hold much water with me. All right, let's go on here. Joshua. Josh says he wishes he had found our podcast sooner. Me too. <laughs> I don't know why, but yeah. He's been listening for a few months now, and his wife has listened with him. Hey, Josh's wife. How's Hello. Nice to meet you. Uh, 
I'm sorry, has listened with him without kicking and screaming, so we must be doing something right, he says. <laughs> so, 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 tell you what, man. You, you stop we are not do tortured. Stuff. Yay! Yeah. Five stars. Yay! Five stars. <laughs> Five star Yelp review. My wife didn't did it hit me. That's right. Five stars. <laughs> we deserve it. Hi, Josh's wife. Hit Josh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. Uh, they have a spare bedroom that they'll be using in a theater. It's roughly 10 by 10 in clothes, and there's one window in a closet. Uh, he didn't want to deal with painting the room, so he bought several blackout curtains to basically cover both the side walls, which would include covering the window for nearly, uh, nearly full light control. And they plan to sit about seven feet away, ice to screen, which will leave about two feet behind the couch. And his wife has reupholstered the couch for this, so she's on board, although she'd like for him to keep the costs well under control. Well, you have come to the right place. Mm-hmm. He's basically about $500 to play with right now. Play with for what? Okay. <laughs> Anyways, I got so five hundred to... bucks burning a hole in my pocket. There you go. <laughs> Can't wait. Can't wait to buy that sub. In addition to, <laughs> sorry, Josh's wife, and I don't know why I just apologize to her. In addition to the blackout curtains, he's always got the material. He already is, has got the materials to construct several uh, DIY absorption panels. He was thinking he would hang the curtains to cover almost. Uh, all the two side walls, except for the first reflection points, where he would place panels instead. So sort of break in uh, a break in the curtains at those reflection point spots. And then he wasn't sure if he put panels on the back wall as well. What do we think is the best way to approach the panel and curtain placement? Uh, I just, I mean, put the panels behind the curtains? Yeah, you I don't mean, need to put a break I, in the I, curtains I, I, because I, I, the curtains aren't doing a whole reason. lot acoustically yeah. anyway. Most of the sound is going right through them. Just hide them. You only have to yeah. cover the, 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 you don't have to put anything, any material over the acoustic panels. You just, oh, right. Just put, put them, insulation put them up there raw. on the wall and then the <laughs> curtain this. goes away. Yeah. If you have enough curtain yeah. material to just yeah. fully cover both side walls, just do that and have some insulation in behind them at the first reflection points. That'll be every bit as effective. You don't need and, to put a break you know in what? the curtains. You know, if you got extra insulation material, just shove that behind the curtain stick. Sure. Just wherever else, but wherever else you could. I definitely nice. want you to have panels on the back wall. You're only going to be two feet I do too. to that back wall. Yeah. So you're going to have some pretty strong reflections, particularly dialogue intelligibility is what we're worried yeah. about here. I definitely want you to have some panels on the back wall. So, but I do too. That, I, I think that's that's fine. And now that you have this extra material that you won't be using to cover the current panels you have, oh, right. you, you <laughs> can use those for the ones for the back wall. Yeah. So for now, they'll be using a 55-inch 4K TV made by Sharp. I'm surprised to hear that name. <laughs> Every time I go to like CES or CDA and there's Sharp there, I'm like, ha, huh, you guys still around, Oh, they're still you? around. So as he, uh, here comes the sneeze. As he said, roughly seven feet from ISO screen, about two feet of space behind the couch. Do we agree with that layout? I mean, for now, I guess it's fine. Yeah, I mean, I would, I mean, I would I mean, have you upgrade that screen size eventually. I mean, from seven feet yeah. away, 75 inches is entirely reasonable. <laughs> so. Well, I know. I was thinking like an 80-inch screen would be great. It could be. But, if, uh, if you're going to do projection. But if you're oh, not going to do projection, uh, you know, 65, 75-inch. I think in here a flat awesome. panel makes a whole lot of sense. It's oh, yeah, I do too. 10 by I mean, 10 room. But yeah, no, I mean, yeah, you're basically like you are essentially three feet from the back wall, seven feet from the front wall, more or less in this 10-foot long room room right yeah that makes that makes sense that placement is fine uh yeah uh, eventually maybe upgrade that tv because uh, 65 or 75 would look just fine in there so before he ever started listening to us he bought a 5.1 yamaha home theater in the box mm-hmm. it includes a rx v 379 receiver i have no idea which one it is five very small speakers and a sub mm-hmm. in quotes it plays lower than the satellites <laughs> that so is cool. factually true more you know, doesn't still can't call it a sub, but you call it a woofer. Without ever using, he's already thinking about upgrades, including a Denon X forty fourteen hundred H dual SVS SB one thousand subs and upgraded speakers. With his five hundred dollar budget right now, he obviously can't get all that at once. Mm. So where w- should he spend his money first? Receiver, sub, or speakers? And we're getting a single five hundred dollar sub woofer. Be okay. Uh, for now, it'll be okay since this room is small. It's got nothing to do with your room, right. the size of your room, and the single sub. The dual subs are to make, in fact, the smaller your room, the more important the dual mm. subs are because it makes the uniformity across the, the, the seats more uniform, which in a room this small can be highly dynamic mm-hmm. from seat to seat. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm okay with you using the home theater box speakers and receiver. Oh, yeah. I mean, that receiver, now. honestly, is entirely fine i mean it passes through dolby vision and hdcp 2.2 and all that stuff on its hdmi ports uh it is 5.1 but you don't need to go beyond that as a starting point 
No. You know? So, I mean, to me, yeah, the first thing I'm going for is a subwoofer out of that. You don't need yeah. to replace the receiver right away. The speakers, I mean, eventually, sure. But for now, they're, I mean, Yamaha's home theater and a box speakers are not the worst things. They're okay. Well, it, it really, in a, in a room this small. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. Output ever, isn't going to be a problem. Output's not an issue. So, you know, this is actually kind of nice yeah. because it will train you to listen to these speakers for a while. And then mm-hmm. when you upgrade, you'll be like, oh, my God, I can hear the difference. Yeah. So it'll be nice to, to, to do that. Now, I'm 100% behind you keeping these speakers and the receiver, chucking whatever it is that they call a subwoofer. Like, dude, don't even hook it up. Oh, okay. Like if you buy if you buy another sub, which is what we're going to recommend, yeah. then the SB one thousand is perfectly fine for this. Room. Yeah, I mean it's a perfect size for this room. The extension will be absolutely fine. You'll get plenty of room gain in a ten by ten yeah. foot room. Uh, I was thinking, could he go less expensive somehow? You're still probably not going to get two for five hundred dollars. The the speed woofer one, the speed right? Woofer, the RSL. RSL. I mean that's what it's I think. Three fifty, right? Uh, no, that's four hundred. So yeah, it's, it's only a hundred dollars left, it, but saving a huge amount of money. But, but it's a little bit. I mean, he's that much closer to affording a second one. If they're well, that one goes down to like twenty five hertz or something. Yeah, I mean, like that. it's it's minus three dB at twenty five hertz. It is ported, yeah. um, so it rolls off fairly steeply. But again, you're going to get plenty of room gain in here, and it, you know the SB one thousand is minus three dB at twenty three hertz, so not right. a tremendous difference there. So, I mean, I would say if you if a hundred dollars is a difference to you, and when five hundred dollars is your max budget, a hundred dollars is a difference to you. Um, we we can get behind the RSL Speedwoofer 10S in this situation to save a little bit of money uh, yeah. and then get it, get two of them as quick as you can. <laughs> right. So uh, he's got a friend who turned him on to our podcast uh, and pointed out that a Fluence 5 speaker package only costs 400 bucks. So we think he should aim for those as his next upgrade. Nope. I'm going to say I no. do not. No. Not that we and the reason- really dislike them or something. If you got them, we wouldn't be saying, oh, that's horrible. But... It's, I don't think it's a big enough difference between your Yamaha speakers and those to be like, that's where you should put all your money. Yeah. It's that type of situation. I would save a little bit more. And, and maybe get some RBHs? Just, RBHs would be fantastic. Yeah. In this room, almost anything would be fantastic. I mean, like, the, it, you could go, if you can't find them anymore, but the Focal, like birds or little birds all the way around this thing would, would be, or, you know, the I am bird sad that those are finally gone. Fantastic. <laughs> they lasted think, way longer than I thought they would, but they're gone. The super birds up front and birds yeah. to the side, he oh, would, yeah. would crush this room. But, you know, a bunch but, of uh, uh, Ascend HTM 200 SEs, you know, they're $300 yeah. a pair. But, you know, so it'd be more than this budget for sure. But right. like those or, uh, yeah, the RBH impression series, something like that. To me, that's where it's like, oh, that's a clear enough difference and really clear step up from your Yamaha speakers that even though total cost, it's a bit more, it's going to be like that was worth every penny type of thing. So, yeah, this is going to lead them down a rabbit hole. Like you said, this is the problem with RB, <laughs> RBH right now. And I, I hate to say this, but it's true, is that they've, they've, they've been very smart, mm-hmm. which is they're like, you can buy our regular speakers or you can get the upgrade. <laughs> and then once you get the upgraded tweeters, you know, those come from this other line, which we also still have. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then, but then if you're there, why don't, why don't, look, at, we've got folded ribbons we, on our other, on our other a, ones. We've got a signature series and then we've got a signature Ooh. reference series. Yes, each one <laughs> is a step up. They are, yeah. No. Yeah, all right. We got speakers made of granite. So Before uh, you know it, it's $1,500 each. <laughs> kind of over it is a, it is a bit of a rabbit hole so uh i i would be 100 percent behind you going for like prime prime speakers oh sure yeah uh, yeah, yeah from speakers sbs well, yeah. uh ascend you know yeah. Aperion, if you could find something over there that you wanted mm-hmm. rbhs would be fantastic kefs would be good uh you know but these all are all of those in, are in that sort of 300 dollars prepare price range type of yeah. thing that that's sort of the price that we're looking at so you're going to be looking at about six hundred dollars. Let's say uh, an extra two hundred dollars for the center channel. So you're going to be looking at like eight hundred bucks. eight hundred. So we're spending like eight hundred dollars on a pair of subs, eight hundred dollars on five speakers. That's kind of the price range we're we're looking at yeah. as a really really worthwhile upgrade. So do we think he should play around with Atmos in the future or just stick with five point one? He wants to make sure he makes the very best out of his this small setup now and in the future. Well, I actually think you're pretty well positioned for this because if you do what we say, which is mm-hmm. subwoofer, then another subwoofer, 
Mm -hmm. then start thinking about your speakers. speakers. Then you would upgrade your receiver. Last. And your receiver would have Atmos, and you have Yamaha speakers that you could put on your ceiling. Oh, right. Yeah, you'd already have the home theater box speakers that you could definitely use as Atmos. And those would be just fine yes, for Atmos speakers. Yes, they absolutely would. <laughs> just, Atmos, Atmos is like, Atmos is the job you give to your your brother who you're like, he's not really trustworthy, <laughs> but you know, he'll probably show up on time and you know, he'll do a half a day's work. That's what Atmos speakers need to be. So that's what <laughs> yeah, no, you're, th this is well down the road. You, your receiver yeah. upgrade is going to be the last thing we're doing. Cause you, you're, it's not really pressing. You're able to pass through all the signals that you need to pass yeah. through your current one. It'll do 5.1. It'll do 5.2 with a Y splitter. So you're totally fine for the time being when you do get around to Atmos and this could be years down the road for all we know, I am going to say I want you to have four overhead speakers because if you're going to do it, you might as well do it right. And that means four overhead Atmos speakers not getting a seven-speaker maximum unit that you could only top out at 5.2.2. So, yeah. but that's down the road. I don't think you have to worry about it right this second. Yeah, we haven't even really addressed the whole fact that he's going to have to get a new TV in any oh, of yeah. this. We're just, we're just talking about the speakers you know, in your progression. Man, now, I'm not saying you need money. to do... <laughs> Do so, all this stuff first, and then you can get upgrade your TV. I'm like, upgrade your TV whenever, mm. whenever that makes sense. But I think to you. subwoofers first. I think that is the number one thing. Subwoofers. Yeah, I would go subwoofers first, and then yeah. you could pretty much pick and choose what you yep. wanted from that point. I mean, I would either say pick and choose between the TV and the speakers. Yeah. But, you know. Regardless, yeah. that AV receiver is going to be the last thing. Yeah. Damien on Twitter, what which measurement microphone to get? U mic one from Mini DSP or U M M six from Dayton? How about the one from Cross Spectrum Labs that's already yep. calibrated for you? How about that one? Yep, and that's, that's going to be a U mic one right now. I was going to say that is the U mic one. Right? They're not doing the UMM six from Dayton anymore. They do still do the EMM six, which is the XLR version. In case oh, you right. want to use an XLR microphone instead of a USB microphone, but if you want a USB microphone, uh, we're going to send you to Cross Spectrum Labs, and that'll end up being the U mic one because that's the USB microphone that they sell. So and they. Answer. He has. He basically takes all every individual microphone yes. that he sells. He takes that and then measures test tones with it, and then he compares that measurement to his professional, his professionally calibrated and you know validated yeah. professional mic. So he measure. You know, he knows what the professional mic measured, and he knows what you measured. Then he gives you a correction curve for your yeah. specific microphone. Nobody else's. That's right. Your microphone that corrects. The deficiencies in your mic. So if that mic, you know, measures, you know, you know, one dB higher yep. at this frequency, you know, or one dB lower at a different frequency, it's going to correct for all that. So its measurements are exactly the same as a professionally calibrated mic. Mm -hmm. Now, in theory, you should send it back to him every year and have him recheck it and stuff like that. But the reality is you're going to use it so frequently. <laughs> but it's going to be uh, about as good as you can ever expect for about what is the premium on it? Like 20 I bucks a, or something like that? I think it's like, like $105 that? total or something like that. Or 120 yeah, well, or something. It's right in that range, yeah. And how much is the mic normally going to cost like you? Like $99, $95, so I think. It's, yeah. it's, <laughs> it's, like, it's like a $20, it's 20 like 25 dollar premium like that, yeah. you know, to have this thing done. It's ridiculously ridiculously you know uh cheap compared to what your you know the peace of mind you get yeah you know when when you take and you're like oh i've got my old art you know our you know uh, radio shack spl meter and there's a correction curve for it but it's not for it it's for everyone that ever came out <laughs> you're like i don't know how this applies to you know this is going to make things better or worse we'll hear you now yeah he's charging 105 us dollars for a calibrated you mic one it's That's awesome. Very little up market <laughs> upsell. Mark says, what are the differences between the Denon and the X4400H and the X4500H? And what about the Marantz SR7012? I don't know. I mean, I think it's probably <laughs> Heos, maybe? Nope. Maybe Heos? Heos is the same. There were very little differences. Uh, so the 4500H is IMAX enhanced. Whoop de doo. Uh, the oh, doesn't that just mean it does all the things that we was already doing yeah, to begin yeah. with? Well, it'll say IMAX enhanced when you play an IMAX enhanced disc on it. Hooray. It just has. DTS Master it's Audio or DTS. DTSX, right? DTSX on it? DTSX. The other one could do it too. Yeah, it it just doesn't say IMAX Enhanced when it does that's it. That's right. 
Yeah. Uh, Me too. The, the, maybe a nice usability feature if you do want to use the uh, like the overlay. You know, you press the info button and what you're watching is still there, and it just overlays the graphic right. on top of that. Uh, it'll do that on the 4500H at full 4K, including in Dolby Vision, which the 4400 uh, didn't do. That one you would it would black out what you were seeing to bring up the de uh, the Denon's menu on the 4400. So that's a little usability thing. Uh, the 4500H dropped the analog inputs on its front panel. So it doesn't have like the left, right, and composite video <laughs> inputs on the front panel anymore. Oh my goodness. What will I do without it? Well, I will have to plug, maybe you plug have to get my the older, camcorder into the older 4400. Where will my Wii plug in? So, um, <laughs> but that's, I mean, there were shockingly few differences that that was about it the Marantz SR7012 is exactly the same as the 4400H except it has 7.1 analog inputs if you that's want usually those. the case with Marantz uh, so it is now the SR7013 would be the equivalent of the X4500H plus 7.1 analog <laughs> inputs so yeah, yeah that that's it there's very little reason to if you can get the 4400 for less money very little reason to avoid it I kind of uh Miss the days when we needed 7.1 analog inputs. Yeah. They both you know? they they both do eARC. The 4400H it required a firmware update to do it, but it does it now. So yeah, yeah. I haven't checked the firmware on my receiver forever. <laughs> I should probably do that. Joe K, who I'm going to assume is Joe Kane, because mm, who else? Would it is be? not, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> Joe currently has a 7.2.4 setup using a Marantz AV7702 Mark II processor connected to two Marantz MM8077 150 watt amplifiers with seven channels each. Mm -hmm. So he has 14 channels of amplification available, but only 11 speakers at the moment. His <gasps> room is 19 feet wide. And he has a 10-foot wide, acoustically transparent screen mounted on his front wall with some Sonance Cinema Select in-wall speakers behind it. And since so he's got uh, the wide room and the extra amplifier channels, he's thinking he might want to upgrade to the Marantz AV8805 and give front wide speakers a try. Maybe Oro 3D2. So... so you got acoustically transparent screen up front with uh, black acoustically transparent uh, fabric all around it. So, right. uh, so that's good, looking good up front. That's an older picture of the front of his room, so it doesn't have the seats and that in it. But uh, also sent pictures of his his uh, current seating. He's got lots of seats, lots of recliners yeah, in there. Lots of, lots of he's seats. got some in wall surrounds and surround backs. He's got some in ceiling Atmo speakers up above. He's got a nice JVC projector mounted on his ceiling. And uh, yeah, this is a wide room. He's got lots of seats. Go what are the two, four, six seats up front, and another five right. seats in behind on a riser. So, uh, yeah. Oh, this is the one that's got the weird little, uh, like I said, it was a kitchenette to the right. Yeah, little kitchenette like in the back right corner there. So, yeah, nice yeah. clean looking setup, acoustically transparent screen up front. And, uh, yeah, that, that's what's going on there. So, he's thinking about, so that's not a question, that's just a statement. Yeah, well, that's, the, that's the setup. He's thinking about some front wides. So one of his Sonnet's in-wall speakers behind the screen has a busted mid-range driver. So he, he, he already purchased three Sonnet Symphony S623T uh, in-wall speakers it is possible to angle the tweeters in these speakers. Mm. He also has some Sonnet Cinema speakers in regular... Okay, he's got these things just everywhere. He's got he? a bunch of Sonnet uh, speakers. In regular speaker cabinets that he has never ended up using since he went with in-walls. His false wall up front is entirely acoustically transparent. It's fabric on either side of the screen. So he's thinking that having the front wide speakers on the front wall would give him the cleanest looking, uh, I guess, behind the front wall. Behind given it, yeah. the yeah, the cleanest looking installation, but he has the ability with a bit more hassle to install front wide speakers on his sidewalls. Or he could put a pair of the regular speakers he has on uh, on hand on a pair of stands for more flex uh, pace blah, placement flexibility. He was thinking that since he can angle the tweeters of the speakers, maybe he could use those as front wides, keep his Sonnet's in-wall cinema speakers as his front left and right, and use a third of these new ones as a center. But what do you think is the best approach? All right. I have strong so, feelings about this. I'm sure you do, yeah. but I'm going to talk about it from a, a sort of more generalist approach. So the idea of front wide speakers, uh, in my mind at least, is the control of that first reflection. Yeah, they, they are producing what would normally be your first reflection point, but like purposely creating sound at that location. So if you think of where your front speakers are, mm -hmm. then where your first reflection point is, that's where your, your wide speakers should be placed. That's correct. 
So it's very hard for me to imagine a scenario in which they would still be behind that front wall. They are not going to be on your front wall. Yeah. Not never. So, <laughs> and the and putting, I mean, in, installing them in the side wall with an angled tweeter, I think is a compromise of pretty epic proportions yeah. <laughs> so yeah. so i would not suggest doing that with the best solution in my mind is that first of all tweeter should not be i mean i know i've talked about it in the past and saying that you know if people want to experiment with it it's fine but in general you know it, it having the tweeter not be in line with the other drivers yeah. is is asking I hate for that any problems. speaker manufacturers do that it's well, it's yeah. just like, you People know, having it. line level inputs on, you know, on subs. subwoofers. <laughs> okay. Level if, they, if they don't, if they don't, yeah, speaker level, if they don't offer them, somebody's going to complain. Yeah. So it's the same sort of thing. So uh, putting the speakers on stands and putting them at your first reflection points, God, the sneeze is just back there, is where your wise yeah. would be. Do you still want to do this? Because I don't even know why you would spend the money to do any of this. <laughs> to, I, I'm, I'll be honest with you. I, I have no... My suggestion is don't, <laughs> basically. <laughs> he's got speakers I, on hand. He's got spare amplifier channels. What I understand that. Uh, well, not to buy another flagship pre-pro. <laughs> that's for sure. But it's only $4,000 yeah. and it can do 13 yeah, speakers exactly. simultaneously. Who cares? Yeah. Who cares? This is literally going to make, sonically, in my mind, about as little difference as you can possibly make. Yeah, I me. like front wides. Yeah. No, I have strong feelings. You are about not this. the most unbiased I, person in this I am, podcast. I am the front wide speaker guy out out in the world here. There's not not that many of us, but no, uh, they have to go at your first reflection points on the side walls. They have to be angled properly at you, not just a swiveling tweeter. I, I feel very strongly about that. Furthermore, you got these upgraded Sonnet Symphony speakers, three of them to be ear in walls, with the idea that they'd be your front left, center, and right, and they should be. Your front three speakers should be identical if you went to the pro trouble of creating an acoustically transparent screen up front. That's sure. that's what you should do. So there's no scenario where I have you using these new Symphony S623T speakers as your front wides. Nope, don't do it anyway. Use the ones that are on cabinets, put them on stands if you're going to do front wides. All right, so it already has four end ceilings or don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, other than replacing the one with a busted mid-range, that makes all right. sense. Yeah. yeah. He already has four in-ceiling speakers for Atmos. He's thinking he could add a fifth as a Voice of God speaker for Oro 3D. That would give him 14 speakers total, perfect for his complement of amplifiers. But the AV8805 can only process 13 speakers at a time. So any issue with having both front wides and the five ceiling speakers, will the 8805 switch between them automatically? It sure will. Yes. Okay. Well, yeah, it uh, on the back of the AV8805, the uh, pre-outs that it has, it has height one, height two, height three, and height four pairs. And that okay. height four pair can optionally be front wides. So what it'll do is when you're using, because the front wides are only going to be active when it's genuine Atmos, not Dolby Surround Upmixer, because the Dolby Surround Upmixer does not use front wide speakers. So genuine Atmos or DTS-X or the DTS Neural X Upmixer. However... The DTS Neural X up mixer is limited to using 11 speakers at once. Two out of those 11 could be front wides, but that means you have to turn off your surround backs. Hmm. So it's not super simple, but it will always switch between them. And when it, you are going to Oro 3D mode, that does not use front wides. So it won't be using those pre-outs and it'll switch over to the, uh, it'll be the height three pair, which could be the voice of God and a center height if you wanted to do that, which you know he's probably going to do that. <laughs> so he's going to be, I have to buy a 15th amplifier. Uh, oh, but uh, no, yeah, you can you can totally have Voice of God and Front Wides, and it'll automatically switch between those based on the listening mode you're using. If anything is going to trip you up here, it's going to be when you want to use DTS Neural X, and you're like, do I do Surround Backs or do I do Front Wides? Because if your Surround Backs are like present in the setup, they will take precedence over the front wides. That's what it'll use. So you have to actually turn off surround backs completely if you want to use front wides. You see how this is not worth backs. it? It's a hassle. <laughs> you it's see how it's hassle. not worth it to me? To this, You see where I'm coming from well, on this? Well, DTS is working on being able to use more than 11 speakers with Neural X. They're working on it. We'll see how many years it takes for it to come. I can't. I don't even understand the idea of even trying to have Oro 3D. I mean, I have. When was the last movie you saw with Oro 3D? I I've never used it. I 
never seen anything offer it. I mean, I don't just watch Marvel movies. I know it sounds that way. <laughs> I don't just watch Marvel movies. All right, Anaheim Josh. It's not the same Josh as before. It's a different Josh. Different Josh. We got many Joshes, right. as has been complained about. We complain about that? No, Josh Z complained that there are too many Joshes and he doesn't know when, when it's him. He's just mad that his last initial is Z and he gets let last. <laughs> Picked last at dodgeball or something. I don't know. Josh, is, Josh from Anaheim mm -hmm. is uh, back to get some more advice. Number one, uh, just don't worry. Those fireworks happen like three times a night. It's Disney World. <laughs> just, Disney World, just get over it. Uh, as a reminder, he has the large 4,500 cubic foot room with two sliding glass doors, one of which never gets used. So his theater gaming area is going to be in front of one of the glass doors and taking up just a corner of the larger room. So I do remember this. Mm -hmm. There's a sliding glass door, and he's not using it. I scrolled too fast. <laughs> Initially, he was going to continue using his silver line audio bookshelf speakers as his front left to right. So it's only be sitting seven feet so, seven feet away. He mostly cares about one primary seat, and he was going to stick with a phantom center. And we said to go with the 75-inch Samsung QLED with uh, full array local dimming rather than the 82-inch edge lip model. Mm -hmm. Gee, I wonder why we said that. Uh, we also said a pair of in-ceiling surround speakers would be worth it since gaming is a priority. But now he just can't stomach having mismatched speakers. Yes, you can. You haven't even tried. You haven't even done it yet. You haven't done it yet. Don't tell me you can't have, do it. We have a lot of worrying I'm, in the mind going on this week. That's I know, dude. I'm, I, I, hey, I'm a home theater professional in here, and I've got, you know, I've got uh, Varus Grands up front. My side surrounds are Emotiva speakers; they don't even make anymore. Mm -hmm. And I, my surround backs are Varus Grands because I had them. You got prime elevation you know, front heights. You've got uh, full cow bird got, top middles. I know, dude. You that's like mishmash. Frankenstein up in here. You can't handle it. You can't handle it. You haven't tried it. <laughs> all right. Plus, it's been decided that keeping all the speakers as close to invisible as possible would be nice. So now he's considering a passive soundbar type speaker up front for his front three channels, plus matching in ceiling surrounds. He had Martin. What? He had Martin Logan Electro Motion series in mind, but is there anything we might recommend more, more highly? Yeah, don't do this. <laughs> Well, what if he wants a center? We would want a center that matches, and his speakers are old That's now. That's fine, but he's talking talk about going with a sound bar, basically. Well, I mean, not really a sound bar. Like, sound bar form factor, but it's still right, you know, I know. It's three it's speakers three built into speakers. one bar, basically. I have something I would recommend in mind. If, if, if that's what you're going to do, if this is more about looks than it is about anything else. Um, this is awfully expensive. The Martin logo in the stack of Eugene. Oh yeah, yeah. But but the one I'm going to suggest to you is the one that Kef makes. Um, okay. They have a passive. Uh, they have two different passive soundbars. Get the bigger one. It's, if you could afford the Martin Logan, you can afford the bigger one. It's the uh, eight thousand three that Kef sells. Uh, about nine hundred dollars for that thing. But uh, you know that's like three hundred dollars a speaker, which isn't out of the realm of you know normalcy. So yeah, that gives you the uh, soundbar form factor. It is passive one. I like the Kef ones. And if you if you got to have matching in-ceilings, Kef most certainly sells in-ceiling speakers. There's lots to choose from in Kef's lineup for in-ceilings. So that'll all work out. If you're if this is just what you're set on doing, uh, I can heartily recommend those. I do not. Uh, clearly, the three-channel passive soundbar is not as wide as the distance he would have uh, between a pair of bookshelf speakers. Will he still get good stereo separation? One person will. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. One person will be just fine. Everybody else's will be screwed. Wow. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. That is true. That is basically true. <laughs> let's not, let, let's call it spin, a spin. Uh, you know, with its coaxial drivers that it's using Whatever, and all that. Whatever, dude. It's, it's, it's pretty You're decent. sitting on the axis to the left or right speaker. Yeah. You're not getting good stereo yeah. separation. Yeah, you do need to there, be between them. But he mostly cares about one seat. He'll get very good se stereo separation in that one seat. There is no reason to do this. There's just no reason to do <laughs> Other than any not wanting to see his bookshelf speakers anymore, apparently. I don't know. What's wrong with his bookshelf what? speakers? I don't know. Just put bookshelf speakers on either out. side of your you TV. I know. Get Kef bookshelf speakers if this is the direction that we're going. I mean, if you really want to spend true. this money, just get bookshelf speakers. And if you're just like, oh my, I, but I want to have a center channel, then buy a center channel. Yes. Put it on a shelf above your Those TV. Those in-ceiling surround speakers is going to make no difference which ones you Zero use. Zero <laughs> difference. They do not need to match. They really don't. The placement is so compromised, it'll make no difference. But uh... 
The passive sound bar <laughs> likely won't pay, play as low as bookshelf speakers would have. Wow, another compromise for no reason. The Mart Logan specifies minus 3 dB at 120 hertz, for example. They're probably being generous, too. <laughs> Will that necessitate a higher subwoofer crossover? Yep, 100%. That one would, and will, yeah. And will a higher crossover negatively affect the overall sound quality? Not necessarily. It kind of depends on the the placement of your, I guess we're now looking at a sub instead of subs. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. I so. mean, so the, the CAF one that I'm recommending, that uh, the larger, the HTF 8003, it claims a minus three decibel point of 70 hertz. So that one's no problem. Cross that, that one's less, it. less of an issue. Cross it over yeah. at 80 or 100, no problem. Um, yeah. So yeah, yet another reason that if you're going to do all of this, I would go with the CAF. Yeah, when you talk about these higher crossovers, what we're really worried about is localization of the sub. Right. You know, and depending on the placement of the sub, localization does not necessarily happen at 80 hertz. Yeah. It certainly doesn't like 79. I have no idea where this is coming from. 80 is right there. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> yeah. not like that. No, it's not like that. You know, but if the, if the sub is, at, is very close to you, then localization mm. happens much higher than you would think or than when we might tell you or the, the, the data might tell you because you're physically getting indi you know there's indication that something's mm -hmm. happening behind you and that draws your you know your attention which draws the, the idea that it, it's coming from that direction uh if the sub is further away from you then you know 80 hertz you'll never notice it 90 hertz probably not 100 hertz still probably not mm -hmm. you know depending on where it is so you know that that's something to think about as well. You know, it's not a hard and fast. It's a it's a rule of thumb. It's it's not hard and fast. We know at eighty hertz, you know, unless you're sitting on the dang thing, you're probably not going to know where it's coming <laughs> from. We mentioned that SV that an SVS SB three thousand would be a good choice for his total room size without being too gigantic in and of itself. And since he mostly cares about just one seat, the single sub should be okay. But he doesn't ever plan to listen at full reference volume, and he doesn't need the back of his room to feel the bass. Zero. Uh, Oh, sorry. It's for the base. Yeah. Uh, just, just the couch. So could a SB2000 deliver what he needs? Uh, dude, I, I don't know how you're going to tell the base not to go into the back of your room. But when you figure out oh, how to do it, there. market it's, it, it's going. and then sell it to everybody. Because everybody who who has a, a, a theater space wants to figure out how to like use those electronic cat gates to keep the sound yeah. from leaving the you know the area so the the base is going there and back probably more than once before you ever yeah. hear it so there there is no this is not like your speakers at high frequencies where the farther to the back of the room you go it gets quieter nope the base nope. is going everywhere those 20 hertz sound waves are 55 feet long and your room <laughs> even though it's larger than your theater area is not 55 feet long that that base is going everywhere in this room it's going to be just as loud everywhere in fact in some places you might get a resonance it's even louder than it is in your theater area even though you're elsewhere in the room so um, make getting a smaller sub is just it, you know, just all asking it's the sub do. to work harder is all you're doing yeah, yeah. to do the exact same thing especially you know like i mean if you don't turn it as loud the bass will not be as loud yep. it will not be as loud for you it will not be as loud for the people in the kitchen yep it is still going to be loud it's just not going to be as loud so i mean he's dealing with so, about 4500 cubic feet right i mean an sb2000 is not like you'll have no bass but it's uh you're asking that sub to do what? You're asking it to do work. a lot. That that's sealed sub. I I'm still on board with an SB3000 as being the correct choice in here. Yeah. yeah. So should he plan on getting a second sub at some point? I uh, I mean it kind of it kind of, really I, I would only say care about one seat. Well, it 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 would depend on when he gets this one sub into his home theater and then starts listening to stuff mm -hmm. and then says this is not good and he tries all the places he can put it right. and it's still not good yeah then then you then i'm going to say yes you need a second sub but if you like get it you throw it in the corner you run your whatever it is and then uh you're like oh that sounds all right to me then you're fine yeah you don't exactly. need a second sub yeah so yeah but so we uh, won't know until you do yeah it. so we wouldn't say plan on it we're saying it's not completely out of the realm of possibility but it doesn't have to be your plan right now yeah the storage room that takes up the diagonally opposite corner from from this space from where well at least from a theater is going to be uh that's just stick framing with a single layer of drywall very thin walls as it were so does that get subtracted from the total volume of air does it who cares if if it's closed i mean it it does uh you know the sound waves once they 
hit a different medium, so we're talking air to drywall, most of that energy does reflect, even though the drywall is, you know, it's just one layer and it's just on stick framing, no insulation, not even closed in on the other side. It's still a transition of medium. So most of that energy does get reflected back. Um, yeah. You know, some of it will even, even though, yeah, you might end up actually, this thing's going to vibrate like crazy. Yeah, that's the, more of the so, concern is that if it's not well might, constructed. <laughs> yeah, if it's just stick framing with, you know, single layer of drywall, depending on what the gap is between the different sticks, I guess, <laughs> you know, you might find that this, that those layers of drywall are going to start vibrating mm. and creating more noise in your room. Yeah. Uh, so have fun with that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's really nothing we can do about it. So, yeah. well, you can beef up the wall if need be. Uh, that's right. That's what, nothing we could do about it. Yeah. Something he could do about mm -hmm. it. But that's... So if he's using a passive sound bar, does the subwoofer have to go directly below to keep the directionality sounding correct? Could the sub go somewhere close to the front of the right corner of the room as a whole, even though his theater area is in the front left corner of the full space? Yeah, dude, you do not need to put this underneath your sound bar. The sound bar, first of all, don't buy a sound bar. But the second, <laughs> it does not have to, the sub can go anywhere in this room, basically. I mean, we were uh, still, originally we were thinking to the just to the right of his front right speaker because that basically would put the sub in the middle of the front wall as a whole right which usually works out well that's that very often right. the case so it doesn't need to go directly below the center speaker that it doesn't have to go there uh you you could try i mean by all means try the front right corner if that's a convenient place to put the sub uh you know you'll get boundary reinforcement it'll make that sub seem a little bit louder by being in a corner yeah. uh, and it might work out just fine so by all means try it but i'm thinking basically what is the middle of your actual total front wall that's where i would expect it to sound best yeah but if you can't you can't you just place put it in all the places you can put it that's right and then yeah give it a try and play sweeps play sweeps they'll tell you so much yeah. rob in perth so hey perth mm -hmm. i used to live in yokine Anyways, uh, last week we talked about uh, Rob's Dolby Vision issues, where Dolby Vision does eventually pass through his Marantz sixty uh, SR sixty ten receiver, but sometimes will after only cycling the power on his Marantz. We said to try turning off standby pass through. He was not using it anyway, and uh, and it isn't quite sure he isn't quite sure how it got turned on in the first place. <laughs> So he gave that a try, no dice. And he's tried changing the order in which his Harmony remote powers things on, as we suggested, but that's still no fix. Mm -hmm. We mentioned that maybe adding a delay after his TV and receiver powered on before powering on his Oppo, but there doesn't seem to be a way to do that in his Harmony activities. He can add a delay after all three devices are powered on, but not anywhere in the initial power on commands. Did he just overlook something? I don't know. No, that I that one you did. You're, you're, you're right about that. When they set up the activities, they automatically send the the power on command for everything, and it's only after that that you can well start. How to... about this? You could then, after all everything's done, uh -huh. send a power off command and then a power back <laughs> on to the Oppo. Hey, somebody's got to make some sort of mouth. That's right, and here. it was me. I breathed in the wrong time. pipe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's actually kind of his very next question. He was like, you, yeah. you could, he could just do the power off, power back on as part of the activity. Uh, yeah. But he's like, it, that he only needs to do this power cycling thing when it's Dolby Vision. So he's like, do I really want to have it always, you know, power off and back on for everything else that isn't Dolby Vision when it's not necessary? This is not the end of the world. I mean, you could have separate activities. You could be like, Power on for Dolby Vision is a specific right. activity, and that includes the power cycling of the receiver, and none of your other activities do. Eh? I mean, it's just a separate activity. It literally, just copy-paste your first activity and then add this new thing to it, and you're done. I mean, it's just one more button on your Harmony remote. Yeah, I, it's, I, it's one, one more right. activity to choose. It's just, I know I, this is one. This is be a Dolby weird Vision. one. I don't it like this weird. one. I don't, I don't know like... why this is happening. This should not happen. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's what, he's, that's what he's upset about, too. He's like, this shouldn't be. I mean, all, clearly, this is not the end of the world, right? This is uh, this is a this first is world problem. First world problems. But, uh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> but no, I mean, I get it. It's a it's a minor annoyance. You'd like everything to work super slick. And it's. Uh, yeah, I like the of idea of just I mean, because quite literally, it is just it just doesn't just doesn't happen often enough for you to really. Yeah care that much so yeah. going into your devices and just power cycling it manually was pr that is almost certainly what i would do yeah if you really care that much taking your current activity making another activity and call it yeah. dolby vision yeah 
is and then adding the the power cycling of the receiver or the player or whatever it takes to make that happen I is fine. I think too. that's the workaround. Graham. Graham has a Plex server and his primary playback device is a Roku. All right, so I got neither of those things. Let's go. To save so uh, storage space, he wants to use Handbrake, but there are a gazillion setting options. Can we make some suggestions for what settings he should use? You don't use Handbrake. You use MKV, make MKV. That's right. I mean, uh, so he is as well, right? If he's doing a backup, he's starting with make MKV, but make MKV just, it just takes the data off the disk as is. Right. Handbrake transcodes things and can recompress it so that you can save storage space. It, you know, it doesn't yeah. have to be a full 30 or 40 gigabytes. You can shrink it down to, you know, 10 this or 12. This dude's, like, totally right, too, though. I've used Handbrake before. I, for a, a, a couple of minutes when I first got my first iPad before we moved to Australia, mm -hmm. I took I, I took a bunch of movies and I used Handbrake to, 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 to rip them off of the disk yeah. or whatever they it was. Shrink their file and then size. shrink their file size. And I maximized them for the iPad. And there was a setting that just said iPad. Right. You put it for that. Uh, and as it happens, there is now a setting that uh, within the presets that says Roku. <laughs> so well, th that is go. that is certainly an option. I would go ahead and use that. However, there's a couple of things, and this is exactly what he's asking about. There are a couple of things that I would change in there. So I would go into there, go to the devices presets, choose the Roku. Now, I don't know if uh, these are Ultra HD Blu-rays, in which case, of course, you choose the 2160 setting, uh, or if these are regular Blu-rays, in which case, choose the 1080p setting. So that's fine. But by default, it is doing them at 30 frames a second, which, of course, is not most of your discs. Most of your discs are 24 frames a second. So go into the video tab and select under the frame rate, same as source. Because hmm. that way it's not trying to interpolate frames that were not in the original. And actually it saves you a little bit more space because now you're only doing 23.976 frames a second instead of 30. So go ahead and do that. Also set it as a constant frame rate because there's no reason your frame rate should be varying when you're talking about backed up physical discs mm. uh as far as the quality goes it'll default to the setting of 22 myself whenever i've done this i have bumped that so as the number gets lower it's actually less compression so i've almost always bumped that to between 18 and 20 i noticed that's literally 19 by the way well, I mean, sometimes I use 18, sometimes I use 20, so sometimes I use 19. So you 19. never use 19? Maybe I have used 19, I don't know, but in the range of 18 <laughs> to 20. Uh, I have noticed that sometimes you get a little bit less color banding, right? I've noticed at the default 22 setting that you quite often get a little bit of color banding, especially like, you know, like the Columbia logo where the light first comes on in the Statue right. of Liberty's hand? Like, you, oh, I always see color banding there, and I'm like, if I set that to 18, it takes up a little bit more space, but usually gets rid of some of that banding, the, the worst of it anyway. Um, and that's about it because by default it'll retain the lossless audio uh while also giving you a two channel aac down mix so it'll be compatible with everything uh and because you are using plex plex will do a great job of transcoding whatever you need so mm. those would be the settings i look at i'd use the preset i just change the frame rate thing to be same as source and if you want to you can maybe you know use a little bit more space and and choose a lower numerical version on that quality setting uh that's about it all right. Tyler. Tyler has an Amazon Echo, and rather than using its built-in speaker, which sucks, he <laughs> connected its uh, analog output to a class, a small Class D amp that powers a couple of nice speakers, and he loves the results. Mm -hmm. So now he would like to connect the Echo to his home theater setup, which uses a Denon receiver. By default, he wants to be able to talk to the Echo at any time and have its audio come out of his home theater speakers that are connected to his Denon. So... Would that mean he has to leave the Denon powered on all the time? Would that be any sort of a problem? Yes and no. <laughs> I mean, clearly you will be using a little bit more electricity than when you were putting it into standby when not in use. But yeah, I mean, in order to be able to talk to the Echo at any time and hear its response out of your home theater speakers, yeah, your Denon has to be on. The yeah, that's just, just the case. No uh, it, it's fine to leave it on. It'll it'll continue to function. You'll use a little bit more electricity than you were before. At idle, you know, it's not too much. What is it like six watts? It uses at idle when it's just it's know. on but not playing anything. So, but that's more than the you know point three watts it uses in standby or whatever the number is. So, just that. So, 
when he's watching TV, he doesn't want the echo to interrupt. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> he can already integrate an echo with his dinner receiver via Heos, but then anytime the echo wakes up, it automatically switch, switches the audio input, which interrupts his TV viewing. So he's thinking just an analog audio connection directly to the echo should avoid this, right? Yeah, I if if, guess, it's, if it's just yeah. one of the analog left analog right inputs, inputs yeah. you would have yeah, to yeah. select those analog left right inputs to then hear the echo. So that should. But this does mean that basically every time you are done, mm -hmm. it's going to you're going to have to switch to that input. You're going to have to switch to back to the echoes left right analog input. Right. Yeah, uh, and since he will no longer be powering the den and off, well, that's actually I think it's his very next that's question. His next so question. question to do with yeah. Harmony, yeah. So he uses a Harmony remote. Mm -hmm. So will he be able to program it so that when he is watching TV, the audio remains on the TV's audio, but when he turns the TV off, the audio goes to the Echo's output every time. What you will have to do is basically kind of what we were talking about with the other guy, which is at the end of every activity, whatever... No, no, no. that doesn't work. No, because he's... You have, to, you have to have it be as part of the power off. But see, so the, so there is that power button on all the Harmony remotes, which all it ever yeah. does is turn everything off. Everything off. Now you can you can have it so that it will not power off your Denon because if you go into the Denon device within your right. Harmony, you can choose within its power options never turn this device off. That is one of the options, and then even when you press that turn everything off button, the Denon won't power off. That's okay, but you can't tell the power everything off command to choose an input on a device before it powers everything off so so what you would have to do is have a you would power everything off and then have a separate com uh, separate activity which is echo and then hit that uh yeah i guess um that's the easiest way yeah because i mean I don't... by default it won't be controlling anything at that point the right. Harmony remote I'm talking about. So basically, you power like at, at your at your very end, and at, I mean, it, it, you could just do this instead of powering off. Just hit Echo instead of off. That's right. And it should power down everything except for the Denon. Right. And switch the Denon to the thing. Right. Yeah. And so, so that yeah. you never use the power off button, you use the Echo button. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Instead. Yeah. Because when you switch between activities, it automatically powers off any devices that aren't needed for the activity you just pressed. So right. you'll just have to get used to not pressing that power everything off button anymore. Uh, instead, or if you do, you after you press it, you have to wait like three seconds. <laughs> you have to and wait then a little press bit. The echo press button. the echo button. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you create an activity that only turns on the Denon and switches the Denon to the analog input that the echo is plugged into, and then it will automatically be powering everything else off that isn't part of that activity. All <laughs> and right. then what you do is you label that button. Off. off that's right <laughs> on your harmony yeah. remote that's right and then and then you tell your family this other button doesn't work anymore you have to press top, this one we don't we don't click that, that doesn't anymore. work anymore yeah that'll turn everything off but it, it does it wrong this is bringing me say, shades of ben drawbaugh because he always used to complain he used to be part of the n gadget hd podcast when that was still around and he would he his major thing was like how come i can't program the the power off button on harmonies and i would always i would tweet back at him i'm like it's one button out of dozens. You can you can make it so that every button on the touchpad, is, so that if, if you're worried about you know doing it by feel, you you literally just mash your hand into the touchpad anywhere, and it'll do the same. Like there were so many ways around it, and yet this is the one case where it's like, nope, you can't reprogram that power off button to do anything different. There you go. Ben Drawbaugh has turned out to be right. So he says, uh, <laughs> lastly, is there some kind of standby pass through that would make it so we could just press the harmonies off button, but the echo will still play through? Is no, there's not. We just, yeah, ju nope. just we just told you what to do. So do that. All right, all right. We're getting to the point where I'm done. So this question, and then we're at. Okay, I'm sorry, that's you're fine. Gonna be mad, but okay. No, no, that's what we did. Okay, we put a good dent in it. Mustafa. Okay, again, on Harmony Remotes. Dude, what is the deal it with is. Harmony Remotes at the end of this thing? On Harmony Remotes, there are hard buttons for menu info, a bunch of other stuff. Sometimes you'll say you'll press say menu when you want to bring up the settings options for your TV, but instead it will open the menu in your cable box or whatever player you're using. Or maybe you press the info because you want to see the audio signal being sent to your AV receiver, but it brings up the TV's info screen instead. Mm -hmm. How do you make it so these buttons bring up the settings that you want? Well, if you make them... On, I mean, basically, if you are changing your mind on what you want the info to do on the fly, it doesn't read your mind. I mean, <laughs> That's right. That. Yeah, yeah. But you can tell it, I want the the play buttons and stuff like that to control this device mm -hmm. during playback. 
you know, when I'm on this activity. You can change those things so that the info button, instead of controlling the info on your cable box, controls the info. Like for me, info on my receiver tells me what speakers are going to be used and a bunch of other stuff. And I often like to see that. Mm -hmm. So you can change those things. Yeah, it's uh, so I mean, what we're getting at is that so you're going to set up a Harmony activity. So you're going to have a watch TV activity, uh, use Blu-ray player activity, whatever those are. But the hard, yeah, yeah, go on. uh, The hard buttons on the remote, like info and menu and that, they will within that activity only send one command. So you can say, okay, I have this one info button, but... Do I want to bring up info on my AV receiver? Do I want to bring up info on my actual television? Or do I want to bring up the info screen from my player, my cable box or whatever? Right. And you can only select one of those as what that button does within that activity. So really to have what you want, which is to be able to say, okay, I at, right now I'm in this activity. I'm in my watch TV activity. I want to press info and see the info on my TV screen. Now I want to press info and see the info from my cable box. Cause y- you might maybe, you know, like you're saying, sometimes yeah. you want to see what speakers are playing. That would be the info on your AV receiver. But other times you might want to press info and Just have that be your cable box. pick another button and, and assign it to that. Well, I mean, uh, what I'm, yeah, if you got the touch screen up top or, you know, the, the screen with the buttons, I would have one that's just labeled receiver info, TV info, cable box info, or the info button is always mapped to the player, let's say. And then I would have yeah. receiver info and TV info as two of my programmable buttons on the touch screen. I have yet to have, uh, have gotten a single activity that uses every single button on, every single hard mm. button on that. No, but they're not going to be labeled the right thing. You have to remember They that. won't be. You would have to remember Somebody that. Else but you picking are it up sitting in, who cares? Here's what other people do. They're not pressing that button. <laughs> they probably aren't pressing it, but they might be they pressing aren't. guide or menu or something, right? And you want That's it- right. You leave those alone. Yeah. You leave the ones that make sense to people, guide and exit and menu and stuff like that. You leave well, those alone. I mean, exit is another good one, right? Sometimes you are changing something on the television itself. You go to press exit right. and it's exiting out of your cable box because that's what exit has been set up to do. So if if you're doing this scenario where you have three different devices like player, AV receiver, and television, and you want to have exit, info, menu for all three of those, you will have yeah. to make it so that you're using the programmable touch screen or you know the buttons that are beside the screen, the ones that you can program, what they call soft buttons, right? You can make them whatever you want. You'll just have to label some of those. So you'll have like receiver info, receiver exit, television info, television exit, and then the actual hard buttons could be for your player. Um, so you'll have to set that up manually in the Harmony setup software and label some soft buttons for yourself. You can't have the single actual hard button do three different things and contextually know which one you want. That That is not possible. All right. Let's answer Ted's real quick okay. it's, it's short. You know I'm down. If you can get away with it, Ted asks, is it desirable to completely black out your front wall with black velvet? Will that increase the sensation of the image almost it, 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 that the image is almost 3D if you're using an OLED? Uh no. <laughs> I mean, I don't... I mean, it's just... It, it, you have no visual distraction from anything in front of you, right? It's just black. Man, I, did, I just boggles my mind that so many people have so many distractions in their lives <laughs> that they can't watch the brightest thing in the room and get lost in it. Like, I watched it, and I'm like... I'm, I get lost in these things, and you people are like, oh, my God, I can see my gray wall. The OLEDs do have a very skinny bezel. There's very, very little bezel around that. Now you're making your what? whole front wall a bezel. Dude, okay, it's an OLED. If it doesn't look 3D to you already, I don't think Well, it does. He was wondering, if it, can it look even more? by just what? The front wall is just black velvet. I mean, Basically, you can make yourself believe anything. Does that make sense? I guess I don't theoretically, know. Theoretically, your whole room being black velvet and there being nothing reflective is always the theoretical ideal. Okay. You know? Do not let your pe- your children or wife in there anymore. Wear, you know, put your head in the vice. That's right. And have like your eyes comp- you know, open with like little things to grab your eyelids and then like an automatic drip thing for eye drops uh-huh. to keep your eyes hydrated so you won't miss a frame. Could and be. then it's going to look the best. You're going to want to get the whites of your eyes dyed black. So they'll reflect. <laughs> <laughs> if yeah. you can get away with it, it's desirable to completely black out your front wall with black velvet. Desirable? Somebody desires it. Uh-huh. Is it going to make any sort of real significant difference in your viewing experience? My answer is no. No Rob visual is going to say, I say go for it. <laughs> I say go for it. Black velvet. You do it behind a projector or on either side of a projector. 
whatever, dude. No visual. So where where is where is he going to buy this stuff from? I'd say buy it from the cheapest place you can find. Yeah. To be with you. If, if you just want to, it order doesn't online. have to be velvet. At this point, well, it's just got to be black. Yeah, but what if it's reflecting some light <laughs> from something? You just want it to be a black hole. Uh, Seymour AV, they sell Fidelio black velvet, which is the blackest black velvet there is. It absorbs like 99.8% of light. It's about as black as it gets. Uh, but they they sell it, uh, the, the rolls are only 44 inches wide and what is it, like $13 per linear foot of that width? Oh, that sounds Something reasonable. Something like yeah, that. That's only going to take you like $1,000 to do the front of your room or whatever. It shouldn't be quite that much. But so that, that's, the, that's the whole hog one if you want to go nuts. That's the Fidelio black velvet. But they do, Dude, you you already crossed in the nuts when you talked about velvet on top the front of your room. Twelve dollars a linear foot, but it's only forty four inches wide. But they do because it's only forty four inches wide and twelve dollars a linear foot. They have baritone black velvet, which is like absorbs like ninety eight percent of light. It's not quite as black. Ooh, as it might reflect Delio. something. Might be a little bit. If you are J J Abrams and you're shining a flashlight from the side of the room. It might not be 100% black up there. Uh, baritone black velvet. It comes in a 60-inch wide bolt. And it's J.J. Abrams does that when he talks to people. He likes to sit with a flashlight on his shoulder. He's like... Well, when he's, he's listening like, to someone else's conversation, he's off to the side shining a flashlight in their eyes. Oh, my God. <laughs> him, and, <laughs> him and Michael Bay. It's, you know. Then Michael Bay's like... He's always talking from below people. <laughs> looking up at them with a flashlight circling around them no abram's gotta be behind them with the flashlight don't be ridiculous come on rob yeah abram's is behind with the flashlight so the the, the halo effect and then michael bay is crawling around the floor looking up their nostrils the entire time <laughs> and then he explodes them oh yes all right, so who we got left? All righty, let's get back to that list there. We have on our list Daniel W., Infinite Gary, Jim B., and Adam M. You will be answered next week, gentlemen. Sure, it's not Adam W., because that'd be awesome if it was Adam West. He's still alive, right? He is not. He passed away, dang it, a year and a half, two years ago now? I don't know. Time always flies, and then I don't know how long it is. But no, uh, not Adam sorry. West. Sorry. sorry or Adam, Adam Wee. Yeah. Remember that was the family guy, Adam Wee. I don't know who that is. <laughs> All right. Uh, to get your, this is AV Rant, so, you know, get your questions in to get questions in. Email us at question at avrant.com. That's the place. Uh, those of you, did I mention the book stuff last week on the podcast? Uh, you mentioned briefly that, yeah, Touch of Pain, that you were re-editing it. It's, that was mentioned. Uh, it is that re-edits are complete. Mm -hmm. My wife is currently reading it, and then uh, Teresa will read it afterwards. You've already read it. That's well, not the re-edited version, but uh, I haven't been very much help at all in the past many years. You have years. not. You you have you have. <laughs> I have made a terrible mistake by letting you be on this podcast because yeah, now my editing. So <laughs> whatever. Uh, so that one's almost done. Basically, Tanel's reading it. My wife and then uh, my friend Teresa is going to read it next, and uh, then that's pretty much it. That's all going right. Now, I, I'm done with it. I think it's good enough. <laughs> uh, Bob, I just re I edited all of Bob since like Thursday. That'd uh, be Bob four. So, Bob Four, yeah. I don't think did I ever reveal the name of that, that thing? Not officially, because you weren't certain the last time I heard. Yeah, I don't know that I ever <laughs> really integrated the name of the book into the book at any point. Maybe <laughs> I should think about that. Is it thematic at least? You don't have to have a character say the name like some stupid movie. Oh, I, I there has not been a Bob book where he does not say he's no hero. He, he says it in every single book, <laughs> multiple times usually. So. Yeah, I tried to. Uh, I tried to. I don't remember. Hostile territory never really had that. No, nobody there, said, "What is this? Some kind of hostile territory?" No, no. Said, but no, desperate no, times, desperate times was definitely in there. So, anyways, <laughs> anyways, I'm working on books. For those of you that care about such things, it it, I've I've lit a fire underneath myself, and things are popping along. I'm very excited about very it. Very nice. So, go, look forward to that. For the rest of you, question at avrant.com. Yes. Get us your questions in here. Uh, let's thank our listeners of the week. We've got uh, Tyler, Joseph, and Daniel who went to www.avrant.com. Click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and send us a paid account donation. Yeah, Tyler, Joseph, Daniel, thank you very much for those donations. And to our 84 patrons over at patreon.com, thank you very much. Yeah, that's patreon.com slash podcast. If you'd like to sign up for a voluntary subscription, you can think of it that way. 84 patrons over there. We thank you very much for the support. 
Uh, and then lastly, Fred, who talked us up to uh, SVS yet again. That's and said some right. good words about SVS as well. So thank you, Fred. Yeah, Fred, we appreciate that. Always good to keep up good relations and uh, congrats on your purchases. All right. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Once your question answered, send it to question at avrant.com. A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.